Welcome back to the Now What Podcast. I'm your host, Arian Foster, Bobby Fino, a.k.a. The Pod God. Today we have a special episode, and I'm going to start out by, first of all, I want to get some news. If you follow me on, at, at Now What Pod, on Instagram or Twitter, we're going to release some news. We're, we're going to be switching services, and I hope that you guys follow us, man. It's a big opportunity for us. Everybody here is excited about it at the at the podcast, and so we're um, we're switching services, and and we want you guys to be a part of it. So the details will follow in the in the coming week. So just be on, be on the lookout for that. But today's a special episode. Excuse me. Today's a special episode because it's what I want to start introducing into the podcast as well. So after it, man, if after after you guys view it, let me know in the comments if if this is the if this is the kind of content that you like. Because I really enjoyed it. And to give you a little skeleton of what, what I want to do is I want to take a, a episode. I'm sorry. I want to take a, a topic. I want to break it down as much as I can. So uh, I wanted to start off with, with, with the topic of logic, but this one was a little bit more enticing. So <clears throat> without further ado, I just want to get I just want to get right into it. I'm going to be breaking down Michael Jackson and the allegations that he's been going through or that have been in the news recently. And when I was first thinking about getting into this, it was a, it was a hot topic, and I, I already know the backlash I'm gonna get. I've I've read both sides, read extensively on this subject, and so I want to kind of preface it with this. I think it's extremely important to believe sexual abuse victims and alleged victims, and I say alleged because we live in the in in the day and time where we're not able to have the technology of a black mirror where we can sit here and record eyes and really really know f- for certain if something did or didn't happen. So I think it's important to to listen and to truthfully care about the the claims of of victims. Now, with that being said, the caveat to that is I think it's our responsibility as citizens to vet these claims responsibly if you care enough about the truth of the situation and we'll learn you'll uh, during this during my little investigation I learned a lot about myself honestly and what was revealed to me was that I really have no business having an opinion on something that I have I haven't dug I haven't dug into we we all can have opinions and they could be very flippant or they could be very well thought out. What I realized was my opinion on the Michael Jackson case cases wasn't very well thought out. I had I had no idea why I thought the way I thought. And it's interesting because when I first went into this, I thought Michael Jackson was guilty. I always did. I always thought he was guilty. It was it, it's kind of folklore in our in our culture that Michael Jackson is kind of synonymous with child pedophilia, right? It's 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 in all these jokes. It's in, it's in every it's kind of it's just interwoven with our culture. So I know I just never thought twice about it. I grew up loving his music, and I kind of always just separated the art from the artist. I've always been able to do that. A lot of people can't, which I understand. But me thinking that he was guilty of these crimes. And me deciding to do this podcast came to a head. And what I found out was, as a 32-year-old man, I am I have a different standard of evidence that is needed for me to believe something. That's what I came to. And I watched the the Neverland documentary. That's what started this whole thing. The Neverland, leaving, leaving them leaving Neverland documentary. And when I watched it, uh, we can just we can just jump right in. When I when I watched it, I I'm gonna be honest. I, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't believe what they what was being sold to me, and it's crazy because I went in thinking Michael Jackson. I went in watching it thinking, okay, here's I'm gonna watch what I've already already known for years, and I went in thinking he was guilty, and I came out feeling uneasy. Like, why do I feel? He's guilty. That this this wasn't enough for me. The documentary wasn't enough for me. So it made me dig deeper. It made me dig more. And I'll I'll detail more of what in the documentary led me to that. And then what in the in my research led me to kind of change my mind and why I don't I don't think he's guilty anymore. 
it was a lot. And without further ado, I think we should just jump right in. So a little background to start off with. I'm going to go through each allegation. And you can't really speak on isolated events as far as, oh, he was in the hotel and the doors were closed. Like, I can't speak on any of that. That that very, that could have happened. It could have not happened. We, we will never know. And so it'll just be speculation. But what I am going to do is I'm going to be, I'm going to be focusing on the trial, uh, on the, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, on the trials of the, of the uh, alleged acts and the court cases of the posthumous at, uh, alleged acts. Because all we can do is we're going to look at the, I looked at the preponderance of evidence and then I made my decision from there. It was tough, but it was, and it was a lot. It was weeks worth of research. I mean, I'm, I'm reading through depositions, court documents, testimonies. It's, I did, a, I did a lot. I probably did more than I should have, which is why I decided to share it because I feel like uh, the information wasn't presented to me in a way that was fair. So... And then there was a, there's going to be a whole lot I leave out too because you understand I, I really think that you can get a degree in the Michael Jackson allegations because there's so much nuance there's so much every single little little detail trickles off into a branch of other things that you have to understand within the context of whatever said point was so there's there's going to be a lot I leave out for people who really understand what's going on in these in these in these allegations they they they'll understand what I'm leaving out and what I'm not leaving out but for everybody else who's kind of just kind of interested. I feel like I'm. I did a pretty good job of summarizing it. Uh, who knows though? We'll see. So I think to understand my, to understand the Michael Jackson allegations, there's really four main allegations. There was Jordan Chandler in 1993. There was Gavin Arizo in 2005, uh, and posthumously Wade Robinson in 2013 and James Safechuck in 2014. So I'm just gonna attack each one and and we're gonna. Uh, I'm kind of going to show you the evidence as to as to why I I I have a lot of skepti skepticism with all of the claims. So first things first, we'll jump in and we'll start with the Jordan Chandler case. This was the first allegation that kind of started the whole av uh, avalanche, and it started in early 1993. And I'm kind of going to break down, give you some times to try to kind of understand the context in which this all came about. So just a little brief background on how they met. Uh, they met when uh, Michael Jackson's car broke down in front of a uh, rental car place that was owned by David Schwartz. David Schwartz is the stepfather of Jordan Chandler. Uh, he was married to the mother of Jordan Chandler. Um, and a relationship ensued. He invited them to the ranch, and that's when the allegations, quote-unquote, started. Now you have Evan Chandler. Evan Chandler is... Is Jordan Chandler's father. He was a dentist. I'm just kind of giving you the the, the key players and all of this. Evan Chandler was a dentist. Uh, he wanted to be a writer. He was credited. He actually was credited f uh, for writing Robin Hood Mid and Tights film. And he was in f kind of financial straits. He he was he was struggling and, and allegedly he owed sixty eight thousand dollars in child support to June, his ex wife, who was who was Jordan's mother. So. I'm going to give you, like I said, I'm going to give you a timeline and what you're going to kind of find out and what I found out was every single allegation, every single allegation is somehow, some way tied to money. And I'm going to explain why that is so, why I'm so skeptical of that little nuance in every single one of these cases. So here we'll start it out. In June 13th, 1993, according to the Ray Chandler book, and Ray Chandler was Evan Chandler's, the father of Jordan, his brother. He wrote a book about all these all these events, and he was there the whole time, allegedly. So Evan reveals alleged concerns about the relationship between his son and Jackson to to a lawyer named Barry Rothman, who was a patient of his. Evan was a dentist, and according to the book, in this in in the exchange of of dental treatment, Rothman offered to help him, quote unquote, end the relationship by either filing a restraining order against Jackson or a custody lawsuit against June. Now this is telling to me, in, in just from the jump from the cross corroborating I did. So you have a, a book who's pro Michael Jackson is guilty versus a lot of these uh documents that are that are pro Michael Jackson being innocent is you have a father who 
has a dentist. I mean, he's a dentist by trade, and in his chair he has a lawyer, and he's already suspicious in June. In June he's suspicious, so he's talking to a lawyer in June, and nothing nothing is done, but he's just he's starting to kind of fish, right? July eighth, nineteen ninety three. He, I mean, he starts, before, before I say what happens there, he kind of starts poking at June and David, Jordan's stepfather and mother. He kind of poking at him, telling them that he doesn't feel right about the, about the relationship and that they should do this and they should do that. So for some reason, and they had the wherewithal to tape the conversations that they were having. And in this, and in this conversation, well, I'll play, I'll play a clip from you and, and this is the kind of stuff I found out just having to do my due diligence and digging that wasn't I wasn't aware of before. So here's a, here's a clip of, of that conversation. This is this is the stepfather talking to the father. Meanwhile, a new development in the child sex abuse allegations at the after against the 35 year old singer Sandra Hughes has details on that. CBS News has obtained a taped phone conversation. The voices are purportedly the father of the 13-year-old boy who is accusing Michael Jackson of molesting him and the boy's stepfather. The conversation was taped in July before the police began their investigation. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. It's beyond, it's beyond his worst nightmares. So one more record. If I go through with this, I will get big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. To be fair, that was actually doctored by Michael Jackson's legal team and released to the press to kind of try to paint the picture that he was an extortionist. The transcript and the tape is is all in the description. You can you can listen to it or you can read it for yourself. You, I have the entire transcript. You can read it for yourself and make your own assessment. I did that. And I still, it still sounded like an extortion attempt to me because if I have, if I have in a, if if I have my son telling me, or I, if I have suspicions that my son is is being molested by somebody, this is not the kind of rhetoric that I'm gonna have. I'm gonna be way more upset. And I'm gonna look to involve the authorities rather than to say somebody's thing. So these were the kind of some of the quotes that I found kind of ridiculous. If your if your son is being molested. He says, quote, uh, this attorney I found, I mean, I interviewed several and I picked the nastiest son of a bitch I could find. And all he wants to do is get out in the public as fast as he can, as big as he can to humiliate as many people as he can. That's crazy. Like, anytime, I've, I've been through litigation before. Lawyers are, are gross, man. And no disrespect to lawyers out there, man. But you know, if you're a lawyer, that your job is to be kind of a disgusting human being, like not... Well, I, you can you can make the argument morally. It's just you're supposed to just dig. You're supposed to because in your mind, your client is is telling you the truth, and you have to and you have to dig at the opposition. You have to do dirty things. And so, as a as a father of a of a child that has been molested, I don't even know why I'm involving an attorney at this point. It's 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 kind of it's asinine to me. Another quote that I kind of found telling was, this is Mr. Schwartz and David talking again. He goes, Mr. Schwartz goes, well, well, let me ask you this to me. Let me, let me ask you this. I mean, why, why can't you meet? Why can't we meet after I get off work? And Chandler goes, because, I mean, it seems to me it's not important. It, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chandler goes, seems to me it's not important enough for you to take off to, off of work. So he's telling, he's telling the stepfather, it's not important enough for you to take off work. How is your son, or talking about your son being molested, not important enough for somebody to take off of work? That's crazy to me. Last quote, last quote is this, is if I go through with this, I win big time. There's no way that I lose. I've checked that inside and out. Win what? I, <laughs> what are you what are you trying to win other than the safety of your child? Like that's it sounds that sounds stupid to me. And we're gonna go continue on the timeline. So it's July 9th, 1993. Dave Schwartz and June Chandler, they played a tape to Anthony Pelicano, a private investigator. Pelicano meets with Jordan. Uh hold on, let me back up. Anthony Pelicano is a private investigator for 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 Michael Michael Jackson. So David and June are kind of in courts with the with the Michael camp at this point, so much so as they play this private conversation between them, 
which is telling because that ends up switching. They they end up not being in the same camp. But at the beginning, they are. They And then they give the tape to this private investigator. So the private investigator goes. Now, now at this point, it's, it's conjecture. This is this is the private investigator's word. He goes and he kind of questions Jordan Chandler. And what he says was nothing has ever been done to him and his dad is just after money. That's what Pelicano says about about it. Now that's just conjecture, admittedly so. So we can only take that at face value. That can't be corroborated with anything. Uh, July 12, 1993, Evan Chandler has his ex-wife June sign a document prepared by lawyer Barry Rothman that prevents her from taking Jordan outside of Los Angeles County and letting Jordan meet with Michael Jackson. And this document also agrees to remit the money, the $68,000 that Evan owed her in back child support. June later says she signed the document under duress since Evan threatened that he would never let her see Jordan again if she would not sign it. So now you kind of see the back and forth between the mother and the father. And it goes on. And they kind of go back and forth and, and they're, they're obviously at, at odds with each other. So we're going to continue on down the timeline. July 14th, 1993, Evan Chandler and his lawyer, Barry Rothman, contact Dr. M Mathis Abrams, a Beverly Hills psychiatrist, and present him with a hypothetical situation, this is crazy, about child molestation. In reply, without having met either the child or the accused, just based on Evan's words, Abrams sent Rothman a two-page letter in which he stated, reasonable, reasonable suspicion would exist that sexual abuse may have occurred. And that's, this is in the Ray Chandler book. So... So this is cross-corroborated cross on both sides. That's so, <laughs> like, come on. You, you, you are asking a, a psychiatrist about a hypothetical situation. And then you end up, and this is in that book as well, you end up using that as kind of leverage in an in a, in attempt to negotiate with Michael Jackson's camp before anything even gets close to courts. I'll detail it in a second. Keep keep uh, f keep following me. July sixteenth, according to Ray Chandler's version of the events, this is the book. Jordan confesses to his father about the alleged sexual molestation, and so July sixteenth is when he is when he actually confesses to his father. And a side note, if you're if you're even more interested in the story, there's a whole there's a whole thing about how allegedly he actually drugged his son in a chair. Well, he's a dentist, so he was performing an operation and he drugged him. It's it's hard to it's hard to weed through the the gossip in this one, but allegedly this happened. And so if you, there there's a whole that's a whole nother deal if you want to dig into that. I didn't think I thought it was worth mentioning but not digging into. Um so July 16th, that's an important. That's when he that's when he that's when he confesses. August 4th, 1993, there's a meeting between Michael Jackson, the private Pel uh Pelicano, private investigator Pelicano, Evan Chandler and Jordan Chandler. So they all meet, and the meeting is basically about what are we going to do about this situation. Allegedly, they asked for $20 million, and allegedly, Michael Jackson's camp went back with $300,000. Now, let's look at this from both sides. One side is Jordan Chandler's side. Why are we sitting here negotiating anything to begin with? That is the stupidest shit in the world. If my son has been... Molested. If I have, if I have a, if a child that's been molested, I'm not negotiating with you. Why? Why is money being talked about right now? That is nonsense. And if you're, on, and let's look on from Michael Jackson's side. Why are you negotiating with Cat that is accusing you of something you didn't do? Well, this one I have a little more sympathy towards. And now, mind you, at this point in my in my looking into this, I still think Michael Jackson's guilty. But I'm looking at it. He's he's an entertainer worth almost a billion dollars at this point, if not already. He's he's in court all the time for 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 a, a multiplicity of things. He's always getting sued. Michael Jackson was one of the most sued entertainers in the world. So all of this is going on, and then all of a sudden, this 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 accusation comes into your across your desk. You're like, whatever we got to do to get it to go away. So I think the max was, they were like, all right, 300K. And obviously that was rejected. Um, so, and that was, that was early August, mid-August and August 17th, 1993, Evan takes Jordan to Dr. Mathis Abram where the boy makes his detailed allegations against Michael Jackson for the first time. And this is what trigger, triggers the criminal investigation 
against Michael Jackson. So, but hear this out. So July 16th is when your son tells you he's, he, he was molested. August 17th is when you take him to a psychiatrist. Not the authorities, but you take him to a psychiatrist. And by law, the psychiatrist has to warn the authorities that a molestation has taken place. So, excuse me. You waited an entire month, an entire month to do something about the confession of your son telling you he was molested. I call bullshit. You're, you're either full of shit or you're negligent as a parent. That's horse shit. I don't care. Even if my child told me, I don't want you to tell anybody. It, at that point in time, my child doesn't know what's best for them at all. I, 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 it, I, and I'm prosecuting for there's a there's a there's a, a variety of reasons like pedophiles usually have a, a pattern and they usually have multiple victims. So even if my child doesn't want me to say anything, which they alleged, if my child doesn't want me to say anything, I have a moral responsibility for all the other alleged victims. Like there might be other victims. So I, I have a responsibility. Like my child doesn't know what's best for them. He could even be not involved, but I'm letting people know. It, it's, I, I call bullshit or negligence, either one. And I'm leaning towards bullshit the more this shit goes on. So August 21st, 22nd, 30th in 1993, Michael Jackson is not there. He's on tour. Uh, search warrants are carried out on his premises in Neverland, Century City, and a Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas where he used to stay with them. And even on August 27th, 1993, there was a Los Angeles Times article that says videotape seized from the homes belonging to Michael Jackson do not incriminate the entertainer and a lack of phys physical evidence alleged sexual molestation has left investigators, quote unquote, scrambling to get statements from other potential victims. High ranking police source said on Thursday, there's no medical evidence, no taped evidence. The source said the search warrant didn't result into anything that would support a criminal filing. Excuse me. So. So here you have a search warrant when my man is out of the country. He's out of the country. There's a search warrant and they search all his properties and nothing was found. This actually becomes extremely important later on in the in the story of the timelines in a whole nother case. But there's an article in, in the description of that of that article of the LA Times saying that, that, that nothing was fi uh, found. Excuse me. So September 2nd, 1993, Evan and June filed lawsuits against each other for intentional affliction of emotional distress and conspiracy. And this is, it just keeps going downhill from here. Now, now, now the parents are suing each other. It, it's just, it just becomes a shit show. It just becomes a circus. September 14th, 1993, Larry Feldman, on behalf of the Chandlers, files a $30 million civil lawsuit against Michael Jackson, accusing him of sexual battery, seduction, willful misconduct, intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud, and, ne and negligence. So an entire month after, after your son tells you he was touched and molested, you go through all of this nonsense, take him to it, and you... You go through all this nonsense, take them to a psychiatrist, they file a criminal investigation, and then your lawyer files a civil lawsuit. So what was important here is that we distinguish the difference between a civil lawsuit and a criminal lawsuit. A, a civil lawsuit is, is entirely different than a criminal, and I'm going to break it down. And the link in the description for the difference is, is there for anybody who's interested in the actual word-for-word -word law. Uh, so crimes, crimes are offenses against the state. That means that even though one person might murder another person, murder itself is considered an offense to everybody in society, in, in society. Accordingly, crimes against the state are prosecuted by the state and the prosecutor, not the victim, files the case in court as representative of the state. If it was a civil case, then the wrong party would file the case. So say I, say I go out and shoot somebody, the state, it's me versus the state. It's not, it's not the family versus me. Uh, the differences in punishment is 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 grand too. So civil cases general, generally only result in monetary damages or orders to not do something. So like a restraining order or something like that. But the majority of civil lawsuits are strictly about money. It's all about money. The the criminal side of that is 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 jail time. I mean, there can be some fines, but it's jail time. So criminal and civil are entirely different. Another huge point of emphasis is the standard of proof is different. And go ask any lawyer. And I'm, the the law is uh, is actually is, the link is in the description describing all of this stuff. But the standard of proof is extremely different. 
crimes must be generally proved beyond a reasonable doubt, where, uh, whereas civil cases are pr proved by lower standards of proof, such as the preponderance of the evidence, which essentially means that it was more likely than not something occurred in a certain way. So a good, a good barometer for you to measure this is, remember that O.J. Simpson got, now granted, I think he did it, but he got found not guilty in a criminal case. In a criminal case, they went over all of that evidence. Now, in a civil case, they turned back around and the the, the family won against him. He ended up paying like $30 million or something like that. So that that's kind of just give you a gauge of, of the of the difference between criminal and civil. So right now, as, as we as we have it, Michael Jackson has a criminal case going on from this from the from the county of Santa Barbara. And he also has a civil lawsuit that he's that he's fighting from the Chandler family. Now, back, uh, back on the time, uh, October 6, 1993, Jordan is taken to a psy psychiatrist, Richard Gardner, who conducts an interview with him. The interview was leaked into the public 2003. This is the most detailed account of what we have of Jordan allegations. That transcript is actually in the description for you to read as well. Now, when I read, I read, I read the entire thing, and, and it's disturbing on his face. I, I absolutely, like when you hear the allegations and, and, you, and you read the words, but... I hate to say but, but when you when when I read it, it it, it became apparent to me that it, it sounded like coaching. It was either it was either coaching or this kid is like just beyond his years. And I'll give you some, and I, I, I admit that it's conjecture for sure, but it's just my opinion. You can you can look at it how you want to, and this is from the the transcript of Jordan and Dr. Garner. He said, you still wanted to go on the tour? Yes, at the time. Why is that? Because I was having fun. At the time, the things Michael was doing to me, they didn't affect me. Like I didn't think anything was totally wrong with that, with what he was doing since he was my friend. And he kept telling me that he would never hurt me. But presently, I see it. I see that he was obviously lying. You're saying that you didn't realize it could hurt you. Is that what you're saying? He said, I didn't see, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Do you see anything wrong with it now? Of course. What is wrong as you see it? Because he's a grown up and he's using his experience of his of his age in manipulating and coercing younger people who don't have as much experience as him and don't have the ability to say no to someone powerful like that. He's using his power, his experience, his age, his overwhelmingness to get what he wants. Now that's now that's true, right? Now that's very true of what he's saying if 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 what he's saying is 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 the truth of 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 what he went through. But Mind you that this this kid is at the time he's twelve years old when he does this. So you mean to tell me a twelve year old kid uses this lexicon? It's it's wild, it's coercing younger people who don't have as much experience as him. Even I mean, just the the reflection of what happened. I mean, these allegations were just a few months ago, right? They met in May. He's saying this in what month is this? He's saying this in October. So the fact that you can reflect on it that fast and and be that articulate with it as a as a 12 year old kid doesn't make sense to me it could be possible i could be i could be way off and i could be wrong 100% but it just it just sounds like the reason why i i even think it's more a little bit fishy is because even from the chandler book now this is chandler's side they 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 said that after the allegations were confessed to his father, they never spoke about it again. So this is really his second time talking about it. And this is this is the this is the rhetoric that he uses to describe the situation. He's using his power, his experience, and his age and his overwhelmingness to get what he wants. That's heavy for a 12 year old. And like I said, he's either really intelligent, like above average, or it sounds like coaching to me. And another one that kind of stuck with me uh was this a little bit towards the end, uh, middle, middle end, was the psychiatrist talk to him, talking to him. He says, what about fears? Any fears of any kind? He says, no. Sometimes people, after experience of this kind, develop different kinds of fears. You have no fears? And he says, maybe of cross-examination, but that's all. I mean, I have nothing to hide. It's just the thought of it. So <laughs> I, I understand why someone would be in that situation afraid of cross-examination, but as a 12 year old, how are you even legally savvy enough to understand what cross-examination really is like that? It's, it's, it just sounds like a lot of these things were laid out to him. Even if it wasn't coaching, it was okay, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna talk to a psychiatrist and you have a possibility of being 
cross-examined by the defense, right? Because we're making an allegation. That's 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 what kind of sounds sounds like it, man. I don't know. So we'll move on. October 28th, 1993. Now, mind you, this is when the criminal case is still ongoing. Jackson's attorney, Burt Fields, writes a letter to the LAPD complaining that the tactics, tactics of trying to manipulate children into saying incriminating things about Jackson. And they, they interviewed 40 to 60 children, according to up to 100 of some sources, that, they, that have spent the night at his Neverland Ranch. No one corroborated the accuser's story initially. All the children said nothing inappropriate happened or suspicious have ever been done to them by Jackson. So you got anywhere from 40 to 100 kids that the LAPD and their investigation have basically interrogated uh, saying nothing happened. You can see the LA Times article about MJ's lawyers attacking the LAPD as well. Uh, there's a side note of Jason Francia. He was one of the kids that they interviewed. And kind of bullied into answering, and and you'll see you'll see why the everything about him is in the link as well. The transcript of when they interviewed him as kid, he even said language like "you guys are kind of pushy." He said things like this while while they were he was being interrogated by the LAPD. Uh, he's he's the son of Blanc, uh, Blanca Francia, a maid who worked from Jackson in eighty six to ninety one, who was among the ex employees who made money off these allegations by selling the stories to, stories to the tab tabloid. All, like I said, all the link and the details of his case are in the description uh it's just not that believable it was it was it was even saw in the 2005 case as well and as you'll see nothing transpired from those allegations in michael jackson's case so it just wasn't that credible you could read about it if you want to but i i feel like in fairness i had to had to even mention it so we're going to keep moving on here it's november 16th 1993 the chandler's law chandler's lawyer larry feldman files a uh, a motion for tr motion for trial preference, which is a special request to have a civil trial heard within 120 days after the motion is granted. This request is usually given to children under the age of 14. So here you have the Chandler's lawyers filing a motion that says we want our civil trial to be sped up in the next 120 days. The law says we can we can get it heard. So they know that that Michael Jackson has a criminal case ongoing with the with the with the with the County of Santa Barbara. So they're saying, we want this civil case sped up. This is good lawyering in my opinion, but piece of shit human in my, in my opinion as well. And I'll tell you, it, it'll, it'll reveal itself in a second. November 23, 1993, Judge David M. Rothman denies a request by Jackson's attorneys in which they attempted to postpone the civil lawsuit to allow the criminal proceedings to be held ahead of the civil proceedings. So to combat that, the, the Jackson lawyers at the time are saying, Yo, let's put let's 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 focus on the criminal. Let's let's focus on the criminal. Let's postpone the civil, because if you think about it logically, you have a civil trial. Which if you lose, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna lose nothing but money. It's just money. And you're Michael Jackson. You can make twenty million dollars in a weekend. If you lose the criminal trial, you lose time out of your life. You're gonna go to jail. So you have these two things that are on your plate. Logically, the choice is you want to put the civil trial after the criminal, especially because it's a game of chess. Court is just a, it's just a game of chess. So say you lay out your civil case, right? Say you have to do your civil case first. You lay out your civil case, all your evidence, all your, all your, all your, all your smoking guns. Well, the prosecution of, of, in the DA, are, they're going to see what that evidence is. And they're, they're going to use that and construct their case around that. So any logical person would say, let's do the civil after. They're filing motions to try to do that. The judge denied it. Excuse me. So December 13th, 1993, Johnny Cochran is assigned to the case and, and the other lawyer uh, stepped down. And this is where the Jackson camp starts to push towards settlement is when Johnny Cochran gets on the case. Now, Johnny, Johnny Cochran, if you kind of look into his background, kind of at the time was known for that, for settling cases. December 20th, 1993, Michael Jackson is strip searched. His genitalia and body is photographed and videotaped by authorities to compare them with the description Jordy gave them of, Ch of Jackson's private parts. Based on the body search, no arrest warrants was issued. So Mike Jackson was strip searched. He got pictures of his of his of his junk token, and this is a huge point of contention for people that say Michael Jackson is guilty. Is they say that Jordan Chandler had a description of Michael Jackson's genitalia 
that matched. And that's very telling if that's the case. And when I was researching this, I was very interested to dig into this. And this is what I found. We're going to jump back and forth from the 2005 cases to kind of show, you'll see why in a second, but it, I, I, I need to in order to kind of make my point here. So admittedly so, only a handful of people have ever seen the actual pictures. They're sealed. So, but we know that one of Jordan's claims was that Michael Jackson was circumcised. So in, in this claim, he said Michael Jackson was circumcised. Well, Michael Jackson died in 2009. And he had an autopsy, and his autopsy is in the link in the description if you want to uh, look over that as well. In his autopsy, it said that he was not circumcised. So Jordan, one of Jordan's, <laughs> one of Jordan's descriptions in of these pictures is that he has saw Michael Jackson's penis and it was circumcised. Michael Jackson's autopsy said that was not the case. That to me is hu that's huge, even more so. Jordan Chandler's family, they're Jewish. So they 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 understand the importance of that action. It's a it's a it's a it's a part of their their theological beliefs. So now here's where we introduce Tom Snedden. Tom Snedden is a key player in all these allegations. He's a Santa Barbara DA, district attorney. And what I've found is that Tom Snedden is kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> He's real unethical in the way he, that he does things. He's Obviously, I, I I can't call him a piece of shit. Maybe I take that back. But he's thoroughly convinced that Michael Jackson is a pedophile. Thoroughly convinced that he's a child molester. And he does everything in his power to try to prove this. And he even twists and bends what he knows to be the truth to try to kind of stick him. And what I found out, too, was Michael Jackson actually wrote a, so a song about him. It's called DS on his history album, his story album. And I had no idea. So y'all Google that. I don't want to get any kind of copyright infringement on this on this podcast. So y'all Google it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dope song. I had no idea that he did that. Mike Jackson was out here writing disc records on district attorneys. But all right, so here, here, here's what we have. These pictures are your smoking gun. Now, let me walk you through this. The 1993 criminal case was never closed. In 1995, Tom Snedden actually helped an helped amend a California law that says testimony from a child under 12 can be admitted as long as there's evidence to support it. So while this 1993 case was going on, the pictures could not be used because you have uh, the Sixth Amendment, which says you have the right to confront your accuser. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, what this, what this amendment did in the California law, and it got implemented in 1995, it says that that you can use a, a child's statement without the, without the kid being there. The kid doesn't have to be there as long as there's evidence to support it. Now, now this was exactly the case for, for Michael Jackson. And that, that California Evidence Code 1360, that's in the link in the description if you want to use that. So, that. so it superseded the Sixth Amendment. Now let's jump to the 2005 case. And we're going to get into the FBI files as well. So the FBI files... Uh, they helped aid at investigations with this, with this, with Michael Jackson for for years. Uh, and in in one of these documents, they say that they interviewed Jordan Jordan Chandler. And now we're in the 2005 case. We're gonna jump back and forth, and I'm gonna wrap it all up. Just trust me. Um, uh, so they said they they interviewed Jordan Chandler, and he said and he said he didn't want to testify for the 2005 case. He was he was uninterested in testifying, and even he'll he would pursue legal action if they kept messing with him. And at this point, he's 25 years old. So Tom Snedden at the end of the 2005 case, and we're going to get into that too, but Tom Snedden at the end of the 2005 case, they're losing that, they're losing that trial and they're, they're losing it, they're losing it big. And he, he knows, so he's, he's kind of doing desperate things at the end of the case. And one of the things that he does is he tries to admit these picks into evidence to kind of try to sway the jury. Because the judge can throw things out all he wants, but if the jury sees the evidence, it's kind of, you're human, it's going to stick with you. So Michael Jackson's legal team knew what he was doing and they filed a motion to dismiss. And that, that motion is in, the, is in the description if you want to check it out too. But I'm going to read part of it. It said, 
Um, the prosecution had the opportunity to request the court's permission to introduce this evidence in the case in chief if it believed it, if it believed it to be admissible. It did not do so. The prosecution filed a section 1108 motion that was more than 60 pages long that made no mention of this uh, proffered material. The prosecution has been aware of this material for more than a decade. Mr. Jackson has consistently denied the allegation that he molested Mr. Chandler. The only reason why the prosecution did not introduce this testimony in case in chief under 1108 is that the court would not have allowed it then for the exactly the same reasons that the court cannot allow it now. This is a blatant attempt to prejudice the jury with dramatic testimony at the end of the trial. So... So the judge threw it out, but the Michael Jackson team, they they knew that this evidence could not be even admitted for the same reason that it couldn't be admitted then, right? Jordan Jordan couldn't testify, so he's no longer 12, so that law doesn't apply to him anymore. Um, So Sneddon knew he wasn't going to testify. Sneddon knew Jordy wasn't going to testify. Tom Mesereau knew he wasn't going to testify, which Tom Mesereau is, is Michael Jackson's lawyer in 2005. Everybody knew he wasn't going to testify, but he just threw it in there as a, as a kind of a slight, and it's kind of like a dirty, it's like a dirty move. Now, jumping back on the timeline, uh, January 4th and 5th, Larry Feldman, the lawyer in the 1993 case for Jordan Chandler, files a motion in which he gives Jackson a multiple choice request. Jackson may provide copies of the police photographs made of his body during the strip search on December 20th, submit, a, submit to a second search, or the court may bar the photographs from the civil trial as evidence. So what that means is the, the Jordan, Jordan Chandler's lawyers are saying either some because they don't have the pictures they're they're the states now and michael jackson's team are releasing them and the state isn't releasing them so if you're if you're solidified that your client is telling the truth why would you why would you kind of play the game of i either 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 submit to another search or we're going to bar those those photographs out of evidence why why wouldn't you want those photographs to to be admitted into your case in 1993 if you think your client is telling the truth it's a it's a bluff to me that says you kind of don't think that your client is is telling the truth that doesn't make any sense why would you do that so to kind of recap about the pictures jordy says it's circumcised it is not circumcised uh Two grand juries didn't deem evidence enough to indict him in the 1993 case. In the 2005 case, when Sneddon did introduce him back, this is the this is the motion, the quotes that he used in, in the motion to try to admit the evidence in the first place. He said the photographs reveal a mark on the right side of the defendant's penis at, at about the same relative location as the dark blemish located by Jordan Chandler on his drawing of the defendant's erect penis. I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true. And correct, except for those statements made on information and belief. And to those statements, I believe them to be true. So two things with that. You're using kind of vague and ambiguous language of at about the same relative location as the dark blemish located by Jordan Chandler. And then you say, I believe them to be true, meaning you never got them cross corroborated with any kind of specialist. It has never been checked by anybody else. It just, it doesn't sound to me like this is your smoking gun. Like this is, this is the thing that's supposed to put him away. And this is the kind of stuff that you're doing. I don't buy it. I don't think, I don't think, I think they knew that, that those picks didn't match. I think they knew that. Okay. Back on the timeline, January 25th, 1994, an out of court settlement is reached in the civil case between Jackson and the Chandlers. The settlement was illegally leaked to, in 2003. And we know the amount paid was around $15 million, but the criminal investigation was still ongoing and there's an LA LA Times article uh in 1994 that that states that that says the criminal case is still ongoing it, it details the settlement the settlement is actually it's in the link in the description if you want to read through that too and the Santa Barbara and the Los Angeles uh grand juries heard uh, had hearings uh in the in the Jackson investigation both grand juries disbanded without indicting him so Despite the investigators ref refused to close the case, they still tried to convince Jordy to testify. So here's, so here's, here's where it's funny to me, man. You have a criminal case that's still ongoing. You settled the case. The case is the case is now settled. Jordan Chandler, Evan Chandler, 
and June Chandler, none of them testify. They all, they all, after the settlement, they all say they don't want to testify. The criminal is still ongoing. The civil case is settled. The criminal is still ongoing and you can still prosecute. You can still, you could get your $15 million and you could still put this man behind bars and you refuse not to. That is, that is, <laughs> let's keep going, man. September, September 21st, 1994, the Santa Barbara District Attorney Thomas Snedden and the Los Angeles, Angeles District Attorney Gil Garcetti make an official statement regarding the status of Michael Jackson investigation. They inform the public that Jordan Chandler is unwilling to testify, therefore they are unable to file charges. Gil Garcetti admits that the 18-month-long investigation did not lead to anything incriminating against Jackson. And he states, Michael Jackson is presumed to be innocent as any citizen in this, in this room if they are not convicted with a crime. We are not charging Michael Jackson with a crime. But you have the evidence of the pictures, right? Like, you don't even indict. That's This is why it, this whole case is fishy to me. So this is the big question. The big question is, why settle? If you're Michael Jackson, why settle? If you're the Chandlers, why settle? Well, let's go. Let's look at both sides. If you're Michael Jackson, this is this is why you settle. From the settlement, this is what it says. The actual agreement, it, it reads this. This confidential settlement shall not be considered as an admission by Jackson that he acted wrongfully with respect to the minor. So there is no admission of guilt in the settlement. Also, there is no language in the settlement that stops the Chandlers from testifying against him in the criminal case. That's telling to me that the criminal investigation was still going on during the settlement. Initially, Michael Jackson's lawyers tried to postpone the civil till after the criminal. The judge said no. There was a law change after Michael Jackson's case that civil proceedings would be subsequent to criminal, which is how it should be. That's what happened with OJ. OJ was tried for criminal, then he was tried for civil. But for Michael Jackson, for some stupid reason, he got tried with the civil first and then the criminal, which is asinine. The logical option was to settle for Michael Jackson. Why do you settle? Well, why do I settle? Is because I have a criminal case that's ongoing where I'll be fighting for my life. Remember, his attorneys tried to postpone it. The judge said no. At that time, there was no law. This, this got amended after Michael Jackson's case. So I'm supposed to lay out all my evidence to try to fight this civil case and then have the prosecution for the criminal case see all my evidence. I mean, I just said this, but I'm just trying to walk you through why it was logical to settle. Like, I'm not going to if I'm fighting for my life, I'm not going to put this evidence on the line. So it's just like, OK, let's settle first. Let's get this out of the way. Since it's going to happen anyway, let's just get it out the way. It makes so much sense to settle given the laws that are involved. Now we go to the Chandler side. Why do you settle? And this is, I can't, I couldn't find an excuse. I tried. I, I hear what they said. They said that they were, they were afraid for their life. There was threats on their lives from, from Michael Jackson fans and things like that. That's why they didn't pursue criminal charges. I cannot fathom that as a father. I, can, I cannot fathom that if somebody has violated my child and for some odd reason, we chose to push for the civil first, <laughs> which is a, a, a another conversation in itself, but we chose to push the civil first and we won. Now, if if I believe that, I don't even care if we, I believe we can win in court or not. That doesn't bother me. I'm trying, I'm, I'm throwing the, I'm throwing the book at him. I'm throwing the sink at him. I'm trying to get this man off the streets. And that's if I don't physically physically harm him first. I'm talking about me. I'm I'm going to go try to play. I might go to jail. But I'm not letting them skate because I got fifteen million dollars. Fuck that money. I I can't I can't I cannot intellectually defend why the challenge was settled. Maybe y'all can. I cannot. And it gets a little bit deeper before we wrap this case up. I know we we kind of we kind of long winded. We almost like an hour in. But uh, November 12th, 1995, Jordan, Chandler's emancip Jordan Chandler files emancip for emancipation from his parents. So, <laughs> so after, after they settle, after everything settles down, he goes and he files for emancipation away from his parents. So he's <laughs> living by himself. That's crazy. August 5th, 2005. We're jumping ahead now. Apparently, they reconciled and Jordan, Jordan Chandler attains a temporary restraining order against his father. So I guess they get into it and... In New Jersey, he filed a restraining order. Now, granted, that case was was dropped, but 
that's what kind of friction they had in their family. June 25th, 2009, Michael Jackson passes away. November 5th, 2009, so this is months afterwards, Evan Chandler committed suicide. He shot himself. So he didn't leave a suicide note. I know that's correlation and causation. I get it. It, 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 it might not be linked. But it's telling that four months after Michael Jackson passes away, he commits suicide. We'll never know. He could have had a mental condition. I don't know. But it's worth noting. I couldn't just not, not leave it in there. So all that wrapped up, that's, that's the Jordan Chandler case. Like, like I said, there's so much more intricate details that, that go in there. It's, it's a lot. But to me, it looked like a successful extortion attempt. It, it, from, from Jordan Chandler's pictures... To, to Evan Chandler's attitude throughout the entire case. You read the descriptions, uh, the transcripts. It's, it's, you, go, you go to lawyers before you go to the police when you feel like your, your kid is being touched. It stinks like extortion to me. I can't see it any other way. I looked at all the evidence. That's just where I'm at with it. You can make your own uh, assumption, if you will. But we're going to move on. That's, that's my assessment of that case. We're going to move on to the 2005 allegation, which is Gavin Arvizo. Now, this one is probably going to be a little quicker because although it was the most publicized case that Michael Jackson had, it was the most, it was the weakest one. <laughs> and it's, it's buff. I could say that off top. Anybody who's actually dug into this case at all, it's it's laughable that this even got brought to court. It is, it is ridiculous, man. I think it's an acu- uh, accumulation of Tom Snedden and the persistent reputation that Michael Jackson held after the first allegation. So we'll get into it, but it's it's pretty it's pretty weak, man. So Gavin Arvizo was a kid. He got cancer. And he was holding benefits at the Laugh Factory, and he he met some people, and they wanted to get in contact. He 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 mentioned he wanted to get in contact with Michael Jackson, and he ended up getting in contact. Michael Jackson talked to him on the phone, and they ended up meeting him. They met in person for the first time. After the first round of Gavin's chemotherapy, uh, they visit Neverland, and it was on that first visit. That first visit. Gavin and Starr was his brother. Gavin and Starr, they asked to sleep in Michael Jackson's bedroom. And this was the night that was referenced in the 2003 Martin Brashear documentary, which we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about in a second. But let me backtrack. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to catch you back up to that point. Uh, May 2001, Gavin's father and mother uh, decide to separate. And according to Janet Arvizo, which is the mother of Gavin, according to her 2005 testimony, it's because he physically abused her and the children. And that becomes an important detail a little later on. Now, August 2000 to September 2002, after the first time they actually meet, they don't really have a lot of contact between uh, each other until the shooting of the Martin Bashir documentary. Now, the Martin Bashir documentary is a case study by itself. It's one of those things where you trickle down, but basically Martin Bashir approached Michael Jackson to do a documentary and it was kind of dishonest how he did it. He he wanted he did it under the guise of wanted to show Michael Jackson and it, my, this is why Michael Jackson agreed. Everybody knew at the time Michael Jackson didn't do a lot of interviews because he was all over the tabloids. It was just gross. So he didn't do a lot of interviews. But Michael Jackson, he had an AIDS benefit. He had a lot going on with kids that he kind of wanted to shine in, in, in his light and kind of answer his critics to saying, I'm doing all this stuff. Like, this is what the world should be doing as well. Um, so that was kind of the guise under which Michael Jackson let him follow him around for uh, months at a time. Now, what ended up happening was it became kind of all about Martin Brashear's curiosity or, or suspicion of, of Michael Jackson's behavior. With kids, so it was real dishonest how it happened. And even when you watch, so Michael Michael Jackson was smart enough to every every single time Martin Brashear's film crew was filming Michael Jackson, there was another camera set up on the side that was Michael Jackson's. And so when you review that film, Martin Brashear is extremely nice and is extremely forthcoming, and he's just kind of praising Michael Jackson all the time. And said you're 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 you doing you doing great things with these kids. I love what you're doing with these kids digging into asking asking real journalistic questions and then 
to turn it to turn it all around. And if you see the Living with Michael Jackson documentary, it, it was the exact opposite of that. And Michael Jackson was hurt, and it did a lot of damage. It was probably the worst decision Michael Jackson has ever made, allowing that documentary to 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 be in his life. So the the big part of that documentary was it comes out about a, about an hour in, and he's with the. Arvizo family is with Gavin Arvizo, and he's kind of explaining the situation uh, of them sleeping together. And so this is a this is a portion of that clip. When you stay here, do you stay in the house? Do you does Michael let you enjoy the whole premises? There was one night I stood in and I asked him if I could stay in his bedroom. And he let me stay in the bedroom, and I was like, Michael, you can stay, sleep on the bed. And he was like, no, 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 you sleep on the bed, sleep on the bed. We were like, no, 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 you sleep on, you sleep on the bed. And then he finally said, okay, if you love me, you sleep on the bed. I was like, oh, man. And so I finally slept on the bed. But it was fun that night. I slept on the floor. Uh, I wasn't sleeping back? No, I just, he, he packed the whole mess of blankets on the floor. <laughs> what? But Michael, you know, you're a 44-year-old man now. What, what do you get out of this? What do you get out of this? Uh, he's four. Yeah, I'm four. Uh, I love, um, I feel, see, I think what they get from me, I get from them. I told, I've said it many times, my greatest inspiration comes from kids. Every song I write, every dance I do, all the poetry I write, is all inspired from that level of innocence, that consciousness of purity and children have that. I see God in the face of children. And um, man, uh, I just love being around that that all the time. Now, that's, that's creepy, right? That's, that sounds, it sounds creepy uh, at the surface. But when you dig into it a little bit more, it, the sting isn't as, isn't as deep. So there's a guy by the name of Frank Casio. Frank Casio was Michael Jackson's assistant. And so he wrote, he wrote a, a, a book called, I think it's called Michael Jackson, My Friend. Oh, my friend Michael, uh, and that's the link of that is in the description as well. So Jackson, he didn't sleep in the same bed as Gavin and Star on that night that they that they were talking about. It at that night that they were talking about Jackson and Frank. Jackson didn't really trust the Arvizos, right? He he kind of felt there was something off, and this is detailed by Frank. And so that that night that they that they all slept in the room together, that's on that documentary. Michael Jackson asked Frank to sleep in there with him. So Mike and Frank slept in the slept on the floor, and the Arvizo slept in the bed along with Mike's two kids, two young kids. There was a three year old and a two year old. So Prince and Paris, they both they all they they was all on the bed. All of them was on the bed, and they was on the floor. So th that kind of context is what I noticed is a reiterating theme that the media likes to leave out to kind of try to paint this picture. Like I'll never defend Michael Jackson sleeping with kids. Because that's not how I operate as a human being. Like I can't defend it because I wouldn't do it. But when you look at everything in the context of who and what Michael Jackson was, it makes sense. And I don't, I don't, I don't find it heinous when I look at all the evidence. Like, if, like if that, if that, think about it. If that's put in the context of that clip, there's probably not the uproar that it was. And this case, this whole case doesn't doesn't happen. And here's why. <clears throat> So in, in, I'm sorry, in, in Frank Cassio's book, uh, he, he details, he said, Michael has to sleep. He's t talking to the kids. He's, I'm sorry, you can't stay in his room. Gavin and Star kept begging. I kept saying no. And then Janet Arvizo, the mother, said to Michael, they really want to stay with you. It's okay with me. Michael relented. He didn't want to let the kids down. His heart got in the way, but he was fully aware of the risk. He said to me, Frank, if they're staying in my room, excuse me, you're staying with me. I don't trust this. I don't trust this mother. She's fucked up, <laughs> which is wild. I was totally against it, but I said, all right. We, we got to do what we got to do. Having me there as a witness would safeguard Michael against any shades, as shady ideas the Arvizos might have been harboring, or we were both naive enough to think. And their testimony actually corroborated them all sleeping in there as well. So this is why it's kind of, it's kind of nonsense, man, uh, that, that that this even got even got kicked off. So to, he, he mentioned Janet Arvizo. Janet Arvizo was Gavin's mother. And to kind of understand <laughs> this case, you have to understand her. She's a big, she's a big part of it. So, Janet Arvizo, uh, 
in September 24th, 2001. And this is this is this was Tom Mesero's plan in in the 2005 case to kind of go after the character of these people because once you dig into the character of these people, a lot of the, the this alleged stuff that they that they're accusing Michael Michael Jackson of doing, there's a trail of it in their past and and we'll go over it a little bit. In September 24th, 2001, there was a settlement reached with J.C. Penney with, Jan- with Janet Arvizo. So apparently Gavin was caught stealing two uniforms from J.C. Penney. A tussle ensued, and then and they're fighting and tussling the security guards, and she accused them of sexual abuse. She said they twisted her nipples. She ended up getting arrested, and there were, there were pictures taken. And a week later, she shows up with bruises saying that they came from the J.C. Penney guards. And it was later revealed by uh, Mary Holzer, who was an office paralegal that worked for Feldman attorney that was with them during that J.C. Penney case. And that that link is in the description as well. Uh, she said that that Janet told her that that it was a lie, that 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 whole that that whole thing was a lie. And it was it was her husband that actually put the bruises on her face. Interesting. So they settled for around, I think it was like around $180,000 or $200,000. They settled the J.C. Penney case. She got divorced from her husband, and and that's when she revealed herself that she said the bruises came from her husband. And that divorce, she said it was her husband that did it. So she she lied on trial in the J.C. Penney case. And after she got the settlement money, she went and filed for welfare. So then she got she got caught with welfare fraud. <laughs> It's a it's a it's a wild it's a wild thing. So let me let me take you back to this. So the shit there's a shit storm that hits after the documentary airs in February. Michael Jackson flies the family out to do a press conference to kind of say, "Yo, nothing crazy went on." So the family comes and and they 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 plan to do this press conference. MJ's PR team ends up saying, "You know what? Forget about it. It's, it'll probably be too much. Let's just let's just put it push it to the wayside." On the way back from Miami to LA, they allege that Michael Jackson licked Gavin Arvizo on the forehead while he was sleeping. And I, th- I think it was his, it was either his mother or his brother that saw it. I have to look back at my notes. But <laughs> just think about that. You're Michael Jackson. There's a shit storm, PR storm. This is your second child molestation allegation. You fly the family out to say nothing was going on. And on the way back on the plane, you get to licking him on the head, abusing him. It just don't make no sense, man. It just doesn't. So in the midst of this, when they get back to 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 Neverland or LA, this is when the Arvizos claim that Michael Jackson is they're they're being held captive by him in Neverland. <laughs> but here's the funny part. In May 2003, she got visited by uh, uh, Child Protective Services. She visited a lawyer. She got visited by Child Protective Services because of the thing, and she she said nothing was going on. Michael was great to them. She visited a lawyer, uh, and this is when it started going down here. She visited a lawyer uh, to try and say that Michael Jackson was holding the belongings of them. This is later on. She visited a, a lawyer and never tells anybody about the allegations never tells anybody that they're being held captive. On top of that, they have receipts of her going shopping. They have they have so much evidence of her a, a calling out, like visiting people, and, and you never mention to anybody that you're being held captive. The story just falls flat on his face, and the deeper you get, the more full of shit it, it, it looks like. And so when you get into the actual allegations, I implore you, if you're interested in this and you don't think this is bullshit for just from what I'm telling you, read the court transcripts. Read the court transcripts of Gavin and Starr, his brother, and it's just contradictions galore. Like, initially, they said in their complaint that Starr and Gavin were both touched. And later on, I'm talking about the formal complaint, and later on, they, there's no mention of it in, in the case. There's, there's no mention of it. And Tom Mesero. Uh, he exploited all of this, and this is why you'll, you'll see as, as it goes on. This is this is this is part of Gavin's. I'm just giving you a small sample sets of of, of how much these kids 
were just all over the place. Gavin, during his, uh, during his testimony, they were talking about Michael Jackson's vitiligo. And he goes, Tom Ezra says, and you knew that that, that that disease was causing patches of white and brown on his skin, right? Yes, I guess. And he said, I don't know. It's not like I was making fun of him yesterday, if that's what you're trying to imply. Well, you knew that his skin is vulnerable to sunlight, correct? Yes. And that's why you see him with an umbrella, correct? Yes. And you also know because of the patches that appear from his skin, from that from that disease, he, he does sometimes put some makeup on, right? And he says, I didn't know about patches. I I I thought he was all... I thought he was just all white. So you tell me, a, a guy that you've seen naked, you don't know about the vitiligo. One, it's all over the news he has vitiligo. Two, you, you've seen him naked. Come on, man. Uh, here's Star, uh, his, his brother. This one's a little bit um, long-winded, but it's, it's, just, it's just wild. So this is Tom Mesereau again. He, well... When you met with the psychologist Stanley Katz, you also described what you claimed happened in Michael Jackson's bedroom, right? Yes. And would you agree that you've given different descriptions almost every time that you've described it? I don't remember exactly what I said. Well, you've given different descriptions about what Michael Jackson was wearing, right? I don't remember exactly what I said. You've given different descriptions of what Gavin was supposed to be wearing, right? I don't remember exactly what I said. You've given different descriptions about what you claim Michael Jackson did in the bedroom, right? No. Well, there were three times. Well, there were times you said Michael Jackson put his hand on top of your brother's underwear, right? I don't remember saying that. And there are other times you said he put his hand inside his underwear, right? Yes. And there are times you said your brother was wearing pajamas, right? Yes. There are times you said he was wearing underwear, right? I don't remember. And there are times you said that Michael Jackson touched his butt and not his crotch, right? When was this? When you did some interviews, right? About what? About what Michael Jackson you claim was doing in the bedroom, right? I never said he touched his butt. Did you ever tell anyone that you saw Michael Jackson in bed with your brother? He was rubbing his butt? No. Never said that at any time to anybody? No. Never said that to Mr. Katz, right? No. Never said it to the sheriffs, right? No. Never said it to the grand jury, right? No. Okay, do you remember when you described for, for Stanley Katz the second time you claimed Michael Jackson was observed by you in bed with your brother? Do you remember that? What? Do you remember telling Stanley Katz there was a second time that you went upstairs and observed Michael Jackson touching your brother? Yes. Did you tell Stanley Katz that Michael Jackson had his hand in your brother's crotch? Yes. That's that's really not what you told him at all, is it? What are you talking about? Well, you told Stanley Katz that Michael Jackson was rubbing his penis against Gavin's buttocks, didn't you? When? The second time? Yes. Did you tell Stanley Katz that? No. It would it would it refresh your recollection if I show you his grand jury testimony? I know what I said though. Are you denying telling psychologist Stanley Katz the second time that you told him the second time you observed Michael Jackson touching your brother in bed, that Michael Jackson was rubbing his penis against your brother's buttocks? No. You never told that to Stanley Katz? No. If I showed you his testimony, would you would that jog your memory? No. I know what I said, though. And see, it's it's everywhere. They have He has no idea. And granted, he's a child, but it's everywhere it's really bad and on top of that he he describes how he how he kind of snuck up on them right that was a big break in the case and and another point of contention of why people think Michael Jackson is guilty is that when you before you come into his room it like there's these kind of like doorbells that go off of kind of letting him know somebody's coming towards his, his bed excuse me so he kind of says that he's he's he snuck up on them and he saw this stuff but there's no way that he could have snuck up on him because of those doorbells. Those doorbells were huge. And it was actually the evidence of, of the prosecution that brought that to light because they filmed Michael Jackson's door, doorbell uh, noise. And it's just, it is just, that stuff is just everywhere. When you read it, it's just, it's just everywhere. So to wrap all of that up and and like i said it could be more it could be more it could be way more but it's it was just when the more and more i looked at it the more and more laughable it got so after after all of that this is what we're to believe after the documentary dropped michael jackson started molesting them like that that is their that is their allegations right and this is how this is how asinine these allegations are we're to believe that the documentary drops and then that's when Michael Michael Jackson starts. It's it's after after the shitstorm starts. That's when that's when he starts allegedly molesting him. And 
to even further confuse you, here's a video of them because my, uh, Michael Jackson's defense was kind of trying to do PR and try to show, show the other side of Neverland since Martin Brashear fucked that off. Here is a video of the Arvizos after the fact praising him and being kind of caught off guard, uh, caught off camera. And, and it's, it's just, it's, look at this clip. Wait, wait, you know how these Bashir, hey, you know how Bashir zoomed in on, on him holding hands? Do that the same that thing. Because, you know, because, because well, that's what a mother and, uh, like, does with a son does. or a father does with a son, you know? Yeah. And they try to make it out to see, be something wrong and dirty. I, Put your back straight. The hand holding thing. Okay. How, how did that make you feel? Oh, we're on camera? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we are? Yeah, I was just rolling. Oh, God! These, this is the outtakes of the out... How in, intensely stupid is that? It's just wild. And the case is riddled with shit like that. So, nobody's story matches up. Janet Arvizo has three different accounts of when she learned of Gavin's ab abuse that's documented throughout the case. We don't really know when she learned. She says it's early, mid, and late in the year. And there are there's different accounts. It's It's... It's ridiculous, man. Nobody's stories matches. Multiple celebrities came out and say the family is a con. Chris Tucker, Larry King, George Lopez all say that this family has tried to con them. The case is so weak, so weak that the jur that the jurors wanted to laugh during during the case, during testimony. There's video over here. Check it out. A lot of the parts of her testimony, I wanted to just break out laughing, but I couldn't. You know, it hurt. Uh, um, she was up and down, up and down. And the parts that I felt that she should have been more, you know, more emotional about, she wasn't. It's insanity, man. To be fair, to be fair, that there is a juror on that trial that thinks he's guilty, that, but just not of this case. Look at this. Jurors who acquitted Michael Jackson of molesting a child are speaking out today in the wake of the shocking documentary, Leaving Neverland. Juror Ray Holtman says he always believed Jackson really was a sexual predator. During the deliberations, I made it quite clear to the other jurors that I was going to be leaving the deliberation room knowing that Michael Jackson was a child molester. But he says the defense created enough reasonable doubt for him to vote not guilty. Are you haunted by the verdict of not guilty? No, I'm not haunted by the verdict at all. Michael Jackson was in a position to hire the best attorneys that could build a case for reasonable doubt, and they did that. So here you have a juror that is convinced of Michael Jackson's guilt of child molestation, but the case was so weak that even he said, I couldn't convict. It's wild. You have 10 felony charges and four misdemeanors. I don't know if anybody knows anything about charges. If you have 10 felony counts against you and four misdemeanors, the odds of you getting off are, are really slim. They are very, very low, man. You not If, if, th if those charges ever get brought on me, I'm not talking about child molestation. If that ever gets brought up on me, for whatever the case may be, and mama, I'm going to jail for something, for something, and nothing. He got off on all 14 counts. That's how weak the case was. It was ridiculous. It was a waste of everybody's time, and it was the big. It was probably the most publicized case in the history of America. If it, it's up there, it's and it, it it was just so bad. It was so bad, and and. The reoccurring theme that I found through all these cases is that the media, and I understand the world we live in and how everybody kind of dogs the media now and it's kind of popular to do so, but the media was so irresponsible in reporting this stuff that none of this stuff made the news. None of this stuff. Because there was no cameras allowed and there was nothing allowed in there. So it was just the height of the shark feeding frenzy of the media, the blood hungry media, and they just want stories. And they had all day news sites covering this stuff and they don't have any content. So you have to invent content. And when you're inventing content and as a consumer, I'm sitting at home watching the, watching the news, 
I'm taking this as, at, at face value. I don't. This. I mean, the internet is 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 a, is around, but it's not like it is today. It's 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 really it's really sad when you kind of document it how instrumental the media was in in slapping these allegations on Michael Jackson. Now, granted, but my, my 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 man didn't help himself with always constantly putting himself in these situations. Um, like if I'm him after the first one, you're not gonna see me with no more kids, even if I was guilty or innocent, and I got off. You're not gonna see me with no more kids. That's just me. But when I looked at it, that to me that was an admission of innocence, because he's saying it, and he even said it. I'm not doing anything wrong, so I'm not gonna stop doing what I love to do, which is being around my inspiration. And children were my inspiration because of the most pure form of of beings on this on this on this planet. But back to the 2005 case, it was it was awful, man. It was laughable. Even the jurors said so. But there was a huge point of interest in this case that people that say Michael Jackson is guilty love to bring up, and I have to address it because when I first looked into it, I was like, okay, maybe he's guilty, and he got over on me uh, at this point in my investigation. So the point of interest is the, is the pics that were seized in the raids of 1993 and 2005, and they say Michael Jackson had child porn. Now, child porn is illegal. And if child porn is illegal, how did he not get indicted? How did he never get arrested for possessing this child pornography? Well, as you're about to find out, as I, as I found out, he didn't have any. But if he didn't have any, why is it still a rumor? Well, this is why. There's a, there's a, Tom Snedden was instrumental in this entire, in both cases. He was a dude that wanted to see Mike go down. And so they were pulling at strings, what I found, in the court cases, and they were doing everything that they could to, to try to sway the jury. And one of them was admitting the evidence that they found in his, his residency. They found so much porn, like heterosexual porn, and they found... No kitty porn, but they found a lot of heterosexual porn. But what they also found were these art photography books. And I describe them as art photography books now, but when I first looked at them, I, it was super suspect. A real funny point, though, was that there was a motion file, and you can see all the evidence that was seized. <laughs> there was one thing where, where it showed... Uh, Michael Jackson's DVDs and all of his all of his porn collection. And when one one said "Pimps Up, Hose Down," I thought that I thought that shit was hilarious. Mike was watching "Pimps Up, Hose Down." That's hilarious. But to get back on a serious note, this is this is what they found, and this is why there's still a rumor going on today that Michael Jackson had kitty porn. There's a book. There was three main books. There was three books. There was called "A Boy," a photographic essay, "Boys Will Be Boys," and "In Search of Young Beauty." Now these three books, I, I first started thumbing through these these pictures and and these books, and I was like, oh shit, my guy pulled one over on my head, and he is a pervert. This is this is gross. Why would you have these books? So I'm looking at the first one, the boy, a photographic essay, and it, and even the cover. The cover has a a little kid standing on a beach, and he's and he's he don't, he don't got no clothes on, and he's just looking over the water, and it's just his butt. And it's why I'm looking. I'm these these pictures are flashing. And I'm gonna try to describe to for my audio listeners. These pictures are flashing on the screen on YouTube. But it's a, it's a it's a little kid with no clothes on, laying on a rock. Another another little kid laying on his back swimming. Another little kid with just tight trousers on, overlooking the water. I'm uncomfortable looking at these right now. And it's just I I I, I immediately thought he was he was guilty. Like just this alone. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't justify if my guy, like one of my boys, had has some of these some of these books, and it's just in his in his possession or in his collection. I can't. Why do you have this, fam? What do you, what is this? And it's another one. It's called Boys Will Be Boys, and the, and the, and the cover of it is four little four little blonde haired white kids, and they they got these tight little swimming trunks on, and they all jumping into the pool. And the last one is In Search of Young Beauty. And it's this little kid with no shirt on, and he's got his cross arms, and he's and he's laying his head on his on his arms like he's like he's laying it on a desk. Now, on 
on face and surface value, I like I said, man, I've said it over and over. I thought I I, I couldn't I couldn't explain this and <clears throat> I was shocked. Then in fairness to the case, I kept digging. And what I found was kind of alarming, man. There's a guy by the name of Todd Gray, who was a photographer that worked with Michael Jackson from 1979 to 1982. And he wrote a book. He wrote a book called Before He Was a King. And like I said, this is an account from 1979 to 1982. So this is a little excerpt from that. When Michael did find the time to relax, he loved to leaf through, the pho- uh, through pho- photographic picture books. He would bring his favorite books with him on tour and buy more books while on the road. The bus waited with increasing number of boxes as we left the city. The Triumph Tour began in Memphis. And he goes on to account. By the time we got to Dallas a few days later, I noticed two... Two boxes, then came to Houston, and by the time we hit San Antonio, I noticed a score of boxes being loaded onto the bus. He especially loved books on Hollywood glamour from the 1930s, richly illustrated children's books, and coffee table books on photography. Michael would usually hole up in the rear of the bus while others spent their time together in the front. I I also preferred the quiet in the back, and I would sit down with him while he was engrossed in in a book of Hollywood glamour photographs from the 1930s. Excuse me, I'm struggling. Looking at a particularly striking photo, he would out loud say, this is magic. They don't make photos like this anymore. He studied the pose, the eyes, the makeup and expression, everything that went into a great glamour photo. So he just goes on to detail his account about how Michael Jackson was extremely into photography. And the more and more that you dig, the more and more that this becomes the case. And there's a lot of accounts of people doing interviews of saying his love photography, his cameras and his eclectic knowledge of photography in general, like knowing things about photography that an average layman person wouldn't know. Uh, even in the Martin Bashir documentary, there's 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 this part where he's shopping for art. He's shopping for art and he he's with Martin Bashir walking and here, here's the clip of it. Pictures, Michael. You love your furnishings, but what about pictures? Paintings? Yeah, paintings. Yeah. I like this one because it's, uh, they're bathing Apollo. This looks like Apollo. Oh yeah. And the girls are bathing him. Yeah. Excuse me. I want that one there. Okay. And this one. Okay. Because we have this, I bought this statue. The whole marble is bigger than life size. That's the bathing of Apollo, right? Yes. Michael definitely knows his art. Obviously. That one hit me particularly, particularly differently, especially as I found this section in in the case. It, it hit me differently. I, I've, I watched the documentary before, but then I recalled that I was like, that's that's intense. He, I, I can't. I don't love art to the extent that he loved art, and that's what I found out, and why I judge those books all, all face value. Here's another here's another instance where Michael Jackson's ex publicist. He was actually on Joe Rogan, and he's kind of explaining his love for art and how Michael Jackson sees the world is is a little different than than anybody he's experienced. We have a meeting with the art director from CBS. I'm condensing the story. There's lots more, but. We're having a meeting with the art director, and she walks in with five of the most gorgeous portfolios you've ever seen in your life. Hand-carved cherry wood, hand-carved leather, um, and these are from guys I know because I I started in pop culture in the art business, and these were my legendary competitors. And, um, And Michael opens the first page of the first portfolio, and he gets a square inch into it, a postage stamp size piece into it, and he goes... Oh, and his knees begin to buckle. And he gets another two square inches into it, just lifts the page a little bit further. Oh, he lifts it even further. Oh, Michael is seeing the infinite in in things that even the artist didn't see it with such infinity as Michael is seeing it. And by the time he gets to the full page, He's having a full-scale aesthetic orgasm. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And remember, the first two rules of science are the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and look at things run under, right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Michael is seeing the infinite in the tiniest of things, and you've never seen a human with this degree of awe, wonder, and surprise anywhere in your life. And I will never see another human like that again in my lifetime. That's a, that's an intense description of somebody, and and the like I said, the more you dig into his life and and the people around him, detail him like this. He was a special cat. 
Here's Larry Nimmer uh, detailing his library. He was the one that did the documentary to kind of combat the narrative of the Living with Michael Jackson documentary, Martin Brashear. He did one and he's kind of detailing about his library and how he had like over 10,000 books and it was just huge. And he's kind of just talking about uh, Michael Jackson and, and his expectations and, and what he eventually believed in. Well, when I was hired to do the footage, I wasn't a big fan. I had always found Michael Jackson interesting. I thought maybe he's a little eccentric. I liked his music videos as regards whether he was a pedophile or not. I didn't really know. I did know that there was a $20 million settlement supposedly in 93. So I thought maybe where there's smoke, there's fire. But I, I didn't really have an opinion one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, I, I came up away with a different opinion. And it just keeps going on, man. The more and more you dig, we could be here all day. But this last one was especially dope to me. This was Wesley Snipes kind of detailing Michael Jackson, talking about his love for art and his depth just as a human being. Man, I met him one time in South Africa, and we were sitting in this, this palatial space. He happened to be there. I happened to be there. We sat up, and we started talking and chopping it up. We chopped it up for like three hours. Uh -huh. And he had a, a, a list of books lined up all along the floor. And I looked over and I said, yo, Mike, you know, people just send you stuff like that. He says, no, that's what I read. I mean, he had everything from the autobiography of Malcolm X, Eat to Live. He had Sri Aurobindo, Krishnamurti. Uh -huh. I mean, like these exotic books, you know, <laughs> that you would never imagine Michael was down with. Right. And we sat there three hours, man, chopping it up about all of this, from metaphysics to psychology to... How the black man is treated, and I was like looking at him like, how the really? black man is treated. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was a trick. The picture is is a little bit different when you paint it like that, and I want to paint it both sides. He could still be a pervert here, right? Like, don't get me wrong, like, but when you have both sides of the evidence, which the media never does, you you it allows you to form a different conclusion than just pedophile. And that's what I that's what I learned. And even even more so when you when you look at the dishonesty of 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 the prosecution, it becomes even more prevalent. So I'm looking at the evidence that was brought in and the books that were seized. Well, they only introduced three books. Why did they only introduce three books? Because when you look at the rest of the collection in the context with that, right? It makes way more sense and it's way less vulgar and it's way less incriminating. Look at some of these other works in there and they're flashing across the screen on YouTube. Um, and I'm going to describe them for my audio listeners. There's, there's, there's like 1930s women in these, in these dresses and naked dresses and, and, and they're, sp they're spanking each other. And there's, it's, it sounds, it sounds wild, but when, as we get deeper, it gets, it gets a little bit more understandable. There's, there's, there's children, there's women in these, in these sexual poses on cars, on, on crosses, and they're, they're, they're naked. And there's ballerinas, there's naked dudes, there's there's teenagers holding speakers, there's there's people smoking, there's old women, old men, pregnant women, uh, little kids, teenagers. It's it's all of the above. It, pictures of kids on beaches. Uh, it's it's like like gay, lesbian, like it's when you when you look at the entirety of of the context of what was seized from his ranch. It makes way more sense and it's way less incriminating. And it made me kind of look at photography art in a different way. It, the way he described it was, was way more beautiful and way more aesthetically pleasing than I, than I look at it originally. And there are people who are into art photography. I was not one. This made me look at art photography in a different way. And that's, that's, this is why I love doing these deep dives into things, because I learn things about myself. This was an, an even more interesting part of this. All three of those books, A Boy, A Photographic Essay, Boys Will Be Boys, In Search of Young Beauty, all three of those books that they submitted into evidence, all three of those are in the Library of Congress. The United States Library of Congress. What is the what is the Library of Congress? It's a research library that officially serves as the United States Congress and is the de facto national library of the United States. It is the oldest federal cultural institution in the United States. The library is housed in three buildings on Capitol Hill and in Washington, D.C. So it is it is kind of the 
like they like they said the de facto um national library of the United States and it kind of keeps an account of all the great literary photographic arts of our country. This is the kind of shit that that is not displayed congruent with Michael Jackson has child pornography. It should be <laughs> because it doesn't sound like it. The last two points of content or last point of contention of the Michael Jackson has child porn was there's two photos allegedly found of two boys. One being Jonathan Spence, who's who's supposedly naked, and another with a boy with an umbrella, with his pants slightly pulled down. Now, I don't know how reliable it is because it's it was it was filed in motion in a, in a motion by the 2005 prosecution. Now we've we've discussed how mi misleading motions can be, and when I look at it. It doesn't, I don't think that these pictures exist because if they do, why didn't you use them in the cases? The judge ruled on, on the admissibility of, of prior bad acts, but the only thing introduced as evidence was those three books. So here you have these pictures that could be incriminating and you don't use them. Not only that, if you have a picture of a young child that's not related to you and it's not displayed in any kind of art, artistic way and you just have a naked picture of a boy that's illegal to have you cannot have that that's that's child pornography you can get arrested for that you, those were seized and no indictment was was issued to michael jackson he didn't get arrested for that i call bullshit i don't think i don't think they had those i think they use it as a scare tactic and emotion i i call 100 percent bullshit that's the that's the wrap up of the 2005 allegations. Um, as you can see, the evidence is is weak, and you can dig into it more for people that think I'm just banging for Michael Jackson. As I said, I went into this thinking he was guilty and looking for something, and try to do it as unbiased as possible. And when I came out the other side, I don't see it. I just don't see it, especially those two cases. So that's the wrap up of those two cases, and we and we, we bring it to the last two, which is going to be a little less timely because. Uh, Leaving Neverland kind of details everything, and I don't have to go exactly into all the details, and we can get just into the cases. Um, we get to Wade Robson and James Safechuck. Now, just a little, uh, a little review. Wade Robson from Australia meets Michael Jackson when Michael Jackson on tour out there. Uh, he wins a dance contest, and that's to meet Michael Jackson. They meet him. He dances on stage. Family pursues him. Uh, to kind of for, for Wade's career subsequently and this is when Wade says that he begins to molest him so to kind of break this down and, and going into these allegations I already know what the documentary did and so I was I was looking for the antithesis of what that was because I wanted to see the other sides as I, as I saw the other the other cases everything was highly misleading from what I saw and from what was presented to me then the other side when I got both sides, I did my uh, summation of it, and it was always something a little bit misleading. So this was this was the kind of the misleading stuff about Wade Robson in the documentary. The narrative of the film kind of leads you to believe that Michael Jackson courts kids, and he kind of like fishes for kids, and he lures and he kind of like lures them in, and that's how he traps he traps the family into getting them to trust him. And it's all about Mike reaching out to them. Now, what was kind of misleading about that was it was really Joy, Wade's mother, who was chasing Michael Jackson. I mean, they when, even when they were in Australia, he won the dance competition. It was Joy who took him to go say thank you. He He invited them up. They watched all the videos. Uh, and even in her deposition, she said that they, they said that they would keep in touch. Michael Jackson said, yeah, send stuff of Wade, you know, I'll keep up with his career. Uh, two years passed when she sent letters and she sent videos and, and never heard anything. Then she comes, she goes to LA and this is the nineties, mind you, this isn't, this isn't today. So the nineties, she's calling around, she's, she's calling frantically is what it is to try to get in touch with them because they're going to LA. She's trying to get a hold of him. 
finally gets a hold of him, which is a amazing feat in the early 90s of the days of phone books and shit like that. You got to work for that. And she gets a hold of him and they end up meeting up. The documentary happens. So to kind of combat that, I mean, the you got to look at the loss, the lawsuit in in Wade's case. He he's not suing Michael Jackson. He's suing MJJ Productions and the estate of Michael Jackson. And there was a summary judgment issued, and where the judge actually kind of details how Joy was actually pursuing Michael Jackson and not the other way around. Because when in in his lawsuit, you can't sue a dead man, so you have to sue the companies, and you have to kind of prove that that they were compliant in in the whole thing. And this is this is from the summary judgment. Uh, from the Wade Robson case. It was the plaintiff's mother who reestablished contact with Michael Jackson through Miss Stakos at MJ Productions, Inc. When the plaintiff's mother and the plaintiff came to the United States, the plaintiff's mother also requested Michael Jackson sponsor the plaintiff's family request to immigrate to the United States. Michael Jackson did so through MJJ Ventures. Accordingly, plaintiff fails to demonstrate a material fact in dispute as to the issue of whether the plaintiff was exposed to Michael Jackson as a part of inherent relationship between Michael and the defendants. Defendants are therefore entitled to a summary judgment on this separate ground as well. So he's basically saying, we're throwing this case out because you 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 didn't prove that that Michael Jackson's companies were implicit in luring you in or or fishing for you, like the like the narrative of the documentary. He threw it out saying it was you that was that was chasing him, which which is why, like like I said, none of this has to do with with Michael Jackson touching him or not touching him. It's just a narrative in the documentary that isn't necessarily true. It's not like they're just coming out and saying their truth. They're not just saying this is this is my truth and I'm and I'm and I'm standing on it. They're they're currently in litigation. That's an important part to to they just kind of gloss over it in the documentary like it's not a big thing. And I I couldn't find exact numbers. I've heard rumors anywhere from hundreds of millions to 1.5 billion or 1.6 billion. I couldn't find documents to 100% corroborate it. If somebody can, let me know. But that's it's a, it's a susta- substantial amount of money. It's a lot of money to be suing somebody for in any case. <laughs> in any case. And they kind of they just gl- they gloss over it. That's an important part of the story. J- Joy was kind of pushing Wade. In her deposition, she actually admits that Michael Jackson asked her to let Wade have his childhood. Now, on the flip side of that, if he's saying that to just let let me get some free time with him so I can do my thing with him, that's 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 disgusting. But it's a point of contention in the narrative of the film. Michael Jackson was actually saying, like, let him chill, let him let him do his thing, which is interesting. Another misleading thing is there was a scene where Wade details the last time he saw Michael Jackson, and he's extremely. I remember watching it for the first time and thinking, damn, my. My man Mike was strung out, and it sounded like he was a drunk. He was he 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 got the wine bottle and he filled it to the brim. He made it seem like it was cocaine, it was liquid cocaine or something. But he just like it's it's amazing to me. He 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 wanted uh, Wade to bring him wine, but you're you're Michael Jackson. You're you're at least a hundred millionaire, and you need somebody to bring you wine. Like it sound it sounded like bullshit then, but. So this is this he's he's kind of describing the time that he that they, they saw him for the last time and it's just real morbid. The kids are tugging on him and he's just disgusted, kind of like, man, I guess Michael's just really going through it. The interesting part is that is in 2009, when Michael Jackson died, there was an opus that was written and Wade Robson had an entry and he describes this exact time in a different way. He says this: the last time I saw him was in July 2008. I was in Vegas working a show and he was living there. Me, my wife, and him. And his three kids had a barbecue. It was the most normal thing in the world. Me and my wife had been to Whole Foods and bought stuff to cook. But when we got there, he provided loads of catering. I said, dude, why do you why do you bring loads of catering? We've got regular food here. I remember cooking outside while Michael sat under an umbrella. We had a great we had great times and he was such a caring person. Most of all, I missed those phone conversations. I still have my mobile phone with his number in it. I just can't bear the thoughts of deleting his messages. Blah, blah, blah. He goes on to Say this is an interesting quote. He says, "One of the one of the main reasons I believe in the pure goodness of humankind." So that was in his opus in two thousand nine. Just extremely opposite ends of the spectrum accounts of the last time that you saw him. That's another point of contention in the in the documentary. And, and 
another one is Wade's conviction of Michael Jackson. That that alludes to it, but he did it a lot publicly on camera, a lot. And like I said, they kind of gloss over that in the in the documentary. But when you realize to the extent that he did and how he did it, it's it's really it's really telling. It's really telling. And I think when you look at Tom Mesereau, who was Michael Jackson's lawyer in the 2005 case, he details Wade's strength of him in that case. It's, it's known that he was the strongest witness. And here he is talking about it. Wade Robson, who's now accusing Michael Jackson of abusing him throughout his childhood, was the star witness for the defense. He was very, very strong in his defense of Michael Jackson. He told me in no uncertain terms he had not been molested, he had not been abused, and that these claims were ridiculous. I mean, this man was so strongly supportive of Michael Jackson, so powerful in his defense of Michael Jackson, that it just shocks me that he's changed his story in recent years. I just can't get over it. I mean, think about it. You're on a trial fighting for your life, and... and... The prosecution goes, they make their opening statement, you make your opening statement, and your first witness you call has to be the strongest because the prosecution just heard all the bad stuff. You got to sway them because as a human, you listen at them like, man, they better come with something. And your first witness, you call Wade Robson. It's, that's your, you got to bring, you got to bring out your home run hitter. And Michael Jackson knows that he molested him. And he brings somebody he molested out in a fight for his life. Second time around, he brings out Wade. It's wild. It's, it's really wild, man. When I, when I looked into it, because I didn't see it beforehand, I didn't know who Wade Robinson was before the documentary. The conviction in Wade is what kind of started to sway me and think that Wade was lying. Well... Initially, I felt like something was off. I didn't feel like he was telling me the truth. But when I, when I saw the conviction in Wade previously to how he publicly admired him and, and, and bigged him up, it, it's just obvious to me that, that Wade felt a certain way. I mean, you, I'll let you be the judge. Listen to his conviction. Um... Probably a number of things. That, I don't know that anybody that lives that life is not going to be your average dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the simple ways, I mean. Yeah. You know, you live that there's you live that kind of life and that sort of fame from five years old. You're not going to go about your every day like everybody else because you've never lived a life like everybody else. So how would you know how to do that? Exactly. So and I think people take those simple things and turn them into something you know, 10 times, 100 times more strange than they are. One of the things I noticed about you, and, I, and this goes back to why I said you were a stand-up guy, um, we covered the trial, and you were one of the few people to stick up for him. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think that was, and why was it important for you to stick up for him? Because he's always been a friend of me. That's what you do for friends, you tell the truth. I'll let you be the judge, man, but to me, that he sounds like he's more telling the truth there to me than he is in the documentary. I can't. I can't prove it. It's just how I feel as a human. And how I feel as a human is what led me to start looking at all this stuff anyway. So I could be wrong, but that's just what it looks like to me. Another inconsistency, which was a huge one to me, is there's a scene where Wade is trying to, well, he is, he's convinced to testify where he goes over to Michael Jackson's house. He is, he is having dinner with him and his family, which for one, if you're a witness in a trial, are you allowed? I don't. Maybe you might be allowed to 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 talk to the defense. I don't know. Maybe, but he's he's at, he's at the dinner with his with his family, and and he feels sorry for for Michael Jackson. He, he's not sure if he's gonna see his kids again, and he just it it just gave him more conviction, and it's very it's very heartwarming that he he wants to try to save him again. Is what he says. Check it out. So we're at the ranch with all his family. Michael didn't look well. Um, he looked very sick. His kids were there. Everybody was there. Like his mind was just in a, in a whole other place. I remember all of us sitting at dinner and Paris, his daughter, just wanting to, to 
uh, wanting her dad's attention, kind of like pulling on his arm and pulling on his fingers and daddy, daddy, daddy. And he was, I mean, he just, he wasn't there. I remember that just feeling really sad. What if he loses? What if he goes to jail? You know, and these are the last couple of times that they see their daddy, you know, which built my conviction even that much more to, uh, to save him. I think that definitely helped Wade to go into the, you know, courtroom feeling, you know, that he wanted to support Michael. So as he tries to do that, there's a huge point of contention. One of the people that were there at that dinner, Michael Jackson's family, was Taz Jackson. Taz Jackson is Michael Jackson's nephew. And he actually tweeted this. He said, if I was not physically there myself to witness this dinner, I probably would not have even questioned it. The story beat is supposed to give Wade the motivation to lie under oath to protect Michael Jackson. The problem is this dinner happened after Wade testified. Oops, he said. So now granted, that's just his word. And it, I, I don't know. But again, you have to look at both sides to make your assessment. But one thing that I did notice and what bothered me is if there are people at that dinner that are adults and are aware of the situation going on in your documentary, why do you omit the persons at that dinner? You have Taj Jackson and Brandy Jackson who were both at that dinner and you omit them from your documentary. It it doesn't make any sense if you wanted to keep journalistic integrity and I don't think that they did in this documentary. Now, another another thing that was real fishy to me is the link is in the description as well. Is when you when you read Wade's emails between him and his mother, when you read those back and forth, uh, <laughs> it reads like he's fishing. That's just me. I, like like I said, I looked at I, I looked at it. I try to look at it unbiasedly, and it just looks like he's fishing for something. Um, I'm not gonna make too big of a point out of it, but that link is in the description if you want to check those out. And when I say the emails, it's Previously, so from like 2012 on, he's he's emailed his mom back and forth, kind of accounting the events that that went down when he was a kid, and it just it looks it looks interesting. Another thing that kind of bothered me in the in the documentary when I when I read back up on the case is the cognitive dissonance of of him on trial in the 2005 testimony was interesting to me. So here you are as a 22-year-old man. You're not, a, you're not a kid anymore. You're a 22-year-old man. And you're looking at Gavin Arvizo, who's going through what we know to be as sexual assault, right? Nobody was there. Nobody knows. But you're a witness for Michael Jackson, for a, a character witness. Now, in the back of your mind, you know he did these same things to you. Your litigation now says that you were unaware, you weren't able to, and, you, and, you're, and you're saying these things, I, I, I didn't have the tools, I wasn't, I wasn't able to understand that it was sexual molestation, but yet you're defending him against these exact same allegations. And he, Tom Mesro even asked him, like, what do you think about these allegations that, that they said about you? And he said on, in testimony, I think it's ridiculous. You, I... It's hard for me to sympathize with you. you have that much cognitive dissonance. I, I don't I don't buy that as a 22 year old man. It's hard for me to see that. Another big reason is in his 2016 deposition, he was asked, did you ever reach out to Gavin or his family for lying on the stand? He said, no. Now, this to me is the probably the biggest telling thing. So after you had your come to Jesus meeting and you realize that you were touched by Michael Jackson nowhere in the four to five year span six years now no seven nowhere in the seven year span have you reached out to Gavin or Vizo or his family and said I apologize it's, it's, I wasn't there for you he says it in the documentary that I wasn't there for him but why wouldn't you reach out to him why wouldn't you reach out to him that's the first thing I'm doing if, if I realize that I fucked up is I'm covering my trail of fuck ups. If I if it's possible, unless you're just a piece of shit, I can't I can't fathom you not calling him and saying, I, I, I was I was wrong. I was wrong and I should have I should I should have been there for you. Like that's to me, I don't know. That was that was a that was a big one for me. Now, here's where it gets even deeper, man. 
Michael Jackson died, and, and and when I say deeper, I mean kind of detailing where Wade was when he figured out that he he was molested. Michael Jackson died in 2009. The 2016 deposition revealed in an email that he wrote to Jeff, uh, I forget his, I can't read his last name. Uh, Jeff, he's a, he's a co-executive producer for So You Think You Could Dance. And he detailed, he says, are you guys working on a tribute show for Michael Jackson? So the day after Michael Jackson dies, you wrote an email that says, are you working on a tribute show? Because I want to be a part of it. <laughs> that's, that's slimy. That is so slimy. The day, you don't even mourn. This is a man at the time where you really care for, you admire, you, every, all of, and, and the day after he dies, you, you on the horn talking about some, you trying to, you trying to profit off his death. That's that's just gross to me. Y'all got it if not. <laughs> um when you look at his legal cases, when you look at his legal cases, it's it's disingenuous at best. He's suing the estate, like I said, the estate and the companies of Michael Jackson. They even go so far as to say Michael Jack MJJ Production and MJJ Ventures are the most sophisticated public and child sex abuse procurement and facilitation organizations in the world. And they call Norma Stikos, Michael Jackson's assistant at the time, a madam or procurer of sexual child abuse and victims. So this is at the, at this point is when I kind of reached my end with maybe they're telling the truth. Because they're they're in a they're in this litigation. And when you start digging into the litigation and understanding the language of the litigation, you understand why they're kind of saying the things that they're saying. Now it's now I, it's either a coincidence or not, and I'll detail it right here. In order to acquiesce to the lawsuits qualifications, you have to imply that the companies he owned and the and the people around him were implicit in the acts of sexual abuse. And when you listen to the language that they said, they said, you know, I wasn't aware at the time. I wasn't able, I, I didn't know it was sexual abuse. I thought it was, they, they, that's the kind of language that they're using. And that's exactly the kind of language that is necessary for a successful litigation in this case. It could be no other way or else the statute of limitations would be out. Now, that's either an extreme coincidence or it just so happened that their time of events played out and the laws were written in their favor. I mean, you could be the, you could be the judge of that, but it's, it's definitely interesting. Another point of contention is in 2016 deposition note, he wrote to himself, in some of his notes, which is extremely pathological in the first place, why would you write this? He wrote, my story of abuse and its effects will make me relatable slash relevant. Quote, it's time for me to get mine. <laughs> One, I don't know why you're writing that down on paper. Two, when he was asked, what did you mean by that? In his deposition, he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know what I meant by that. Which is a crock of shit if you ask me. It, these little things start to build up and it just, it just the, the character credibility just starts to dwindle for me. And you kind of see in, in, in places where he actually lied, where you could actually say he lied, not just earlier when he was defending Michael Jackson, but also when, during, during litigation. During litigation, he says that he, part of it says he, did, he was unaware that Michael Jackson had an estate for him to be liable or uh yeah for him to be um what's the word cut me in at the right time y'all eligible for him to be eligible to sue the Michael Jackson estate he had to it had to be unbeknownst to him that Michael Jackson had an estate and so that's what he stated in his lawsuit in 2013. In 2011, though, he wrote an email to the Michael Jackson estate trying to get, trying to, trying to direct the Cirque du Soleil show for Michael Jackson. And the last paragraph, he said, 
Why should I believe that this job is not going to be too much for me? Because of all that I learned through this process, directing a film was a completely new realm that I ended up not being ready for, but the dancing, dancing and choreography is what I have done my entire life, and I now know how to do this. And there are very few subjects I know more than Michael Jackson. Right before that, he said, I am passionate, about, passionate to do this show. I want to make it amazing for me, you, for Cirque, and, of course, Michael. So that was in 2011, months before he figured out that he was abused. He's praising Michael Jackson once again. And he also knew Michael Jackson had an estate. So he's lying and he sounds like he's desperate. He didn't get the job. And that's what the theme is. Is like he he's he's running around Hollywood trying to trying to find work. And when you when you dig into that, all a lot of a lot of Hollywood came for him when he when he when he made these allegations saying that nah you 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 kind of just burnt bridges in this industry and you're going broke and it's just it's it's really bad. I didn't want to get into the gospel side of it, but that's a, a lot of his peers are saying that. This is the last point of contention, man, before we move on to James Safechuck, but it was a huge one. And the fact that they didn't put this in the documentary lets me know exactly what the motive for that documentary was. In 2011, around that same time, he sold some of his Michael Jackson memorabilia months before he realized his abuse once again. So you remember that smooth criminal hat that they went on about in the documentary? Yeah, he sold that. He sold that on a website called Julian's Auctions. Uh, uh, auctions, yeah. Uh, he sold that 625 2011 and 1021 2011. He sold he sold uh, Michael Jackson bad era gloves. So that's these gloves, and they're gonna be on the screen for y'all to watch them, or for, for you to see them on on YouTube. Uh, he sold those both of those items. Months before he realized his abuse, and it was a big shitstorm on Twitter, uh, the investigation website, and Julian's Auctions actually has a Twitter account, and they they were being asked about this, and they responded. They said, Wade consigned his collection to us directly. He was the person we paid when we sold his collection. He needed the money. <laughs> it's weird that they're this direct, but they, they went on to say, Wade asked to remain anonymous and said that he did not want anyone to know that it was him selling the items in 2011, but we did not agree to that and listed it as the Wade Robson collection. He consigned multiple items and wanted us to sell all items of his that had value. So that shit is huge to me. You selling the MJ memorabilia at the time means something to you because you, you did not know yet that you were abused, but you selling off the memorabilia, and this is what I think is horseshit about that that last scene too, where he's burning all the Michael Jackson memorabilia. Well, he didn't burn the smooth criminal hat because he already sold it and he got money for it. So a, a lot of inconsistencies. There's more, like I said, there's more about Wade Robson. I, I don't. I'm, I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. Really, we going on two hours now, but it's it's just interesting shit, and and there's a lot left out in the documentary. And I don't think that documentary was jour journalistically um, sound. I think that they just wanted to tell one side of the story. And it's not, that's not really what a documentary, in my opinion, is about. It's really, this was really more, it was more like propaganda <laughs> when you dig into it. And even even if they're telling the truth, it's still propaganda because you're just you're just doing it to sell a, sell a side of a story without telling both sides. You're not giving an honest account of, of, of the events. Um, we're going to go into the last one now. The last one is James Safechuck. James Safechuck was the last uh, victim to alleged sexual abuse of Michael Jackson. And he was, he met him at a Pepsi shoot in, I think it was 88. And it ensued from there. The relationship ensued from there. Same, you, you saw the the documentary. There's not as much on him because his case that hasn't, and didn't make it to the discovery stage before it got brought out. But again, when you listen to the language that he uses and the language that Wade uses, it's very similar. And granted, that can be the case in sexual, sexually abused victims. And I preface this entire podcast with, I think it's important to listen to people. And I did. I listened to them with an open eye. And I listened to their, to their claims. And I feel like I, I cared enough to want to dig into this case, so I vetted the claims. And what I found was what I found to be dishonesty. And it doesn't mean that I'm not calling them liars. They could be telling the truth. I'm just saying I don't believe it. And 
the burden of proof is shaky when you're dealing with sex abuse claims. It's 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 tough, but when when you do it in the court of public opinion, I think it's our, I think it's our responsibility to do it responsibly, and that's what I try to do here. And so when you look at James Safechuck's claim, it's it's very similar to Wade's, and he had to he had to appeal to the statute of limitations, and the statute of limitations is uh, well, I'll just I'll just read his 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 claim. His claim says. At, as set forth in the petition, Jackson manipulated Safechuck into believing from a young age that no one would understand their relationship. It was only once Safechuck was able to realize with the help of a therapist that his symptoms and his breakdown arose from childhood sexual abuse and the relationship surrounding it. It was finally that, that he was finally able to begin to real, uh, recognize that he was the victim of childhood sexual abuse. And so it is... It is the same kind of language that that Wade uses, and I keep emphasizing that because I don't know if if, if you've ever been in, into any kind of litigation. Has anybody ever sued you? Have you ever been in a lawsuit? When you're dealing with that person one on one, you notice the day after that they've talked to the lawyer. You've noticed the day, and the reason is because what they start saying to you, they start using very nefarious language. They start using language that is not common lexicon it's not it's not colloquially used it's 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 litigation talk it's because from here on out these text messages are going to become court documents and you notice it the day it happens and when i first watched the film that's what i noticed i noticed that they were talking in litigation terms that's what struck me and that that's what really egged me on to start Aside from their body language, it's it's what really egged me on to start digging into this because I was like, it, it sounds fishy. That doesn't sound like two people talking. It sounds like two people putting together an account of what happened to later be introduced as evidence. That's what it sounded like to me. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the to the to the litigation, but they when you read the California child sex abuse laws, uh, when you read over things like equitable estoppel, and it's all in the description link. Um, it, it, it basically, it, it basically is saying that you have after you're 18 years old, you have eight years to file a claim for sexual abuse. After that, the statute of limitations runs, runs out, unless the child abuse was unknown to you. If it was unknown to you and you develop later effects and where it was kind of realized. Which again, it happens to people. A hundred percent, it does happen to people. Like I said, it's either extremely coincidental that it happened with them, or it's, and the laws are very favorable, or they built their story around these laws. And the more I dig into it, the more I think that it's the latter. Um, so along with all these, all this language, it's, it's just very odd timing to me. And this is why in the documentary, James says in 2005 trial, they asked him and his parents to testify. He declined and he told his parents that Michael's not a, Michael's a bad man. He's not a, he's not a good man. And they didn't talk about it after that, but they, from that infliction they knew and she knew enough james's mother knew enough that michael jackson was was molesting him because in 2009 she says in a documentary that when he died she celebrated she jumped up and down and said he can't hurt any more children in in james safe chuck's lawsuit he says it wasn't until 2013 and in oprah he says it wasn't until 2013 where he realized after watching wade's uh, coming out that, yeah, that's what this was. This is why I hate myself. His body's buzzing and all of that stuff. All those key terms. He 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 said that in 2013. He figured that out. So your claim of, I didn't know it was abuse, is kind of mute when you knew he was a bad man and your mom eluded enough to it so much so that she knew that she, that you were molested, but yet you didn't know what happened to you until 2013. That's a big inconsistency in my book. Just to me, I, it's, he's a bad man. You don't want to testify for him, but yet you don't, you didn't know that he touched you yet. It took you four years to realize he, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound like I'm judging a sex abuse victim, but it just sounds fishy when you couple it with uh, these things that I'm, I'm going to detail in a second. 
in 2013, April 26, 2013, James Safechuck was actually getting sued by a family member for some family business issues. He was getting sued for around $300,000. And it was purposefully omitted in the documentary as well. So, like I said, from the onset of this entire podcast, each allegation comes with some kind of monetary attachment to it. There's never anything that is... Nobody wants any money. I don't want anything from Michael Jackson. I don't want anything from his estate. I didn't ever want anything. All I want to do is tell my story. That would make me believe you a thousand times more than if something is attached to it. And granted, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pursue and close have closure how you want to have closure. I'm just saying for me, it doesn't make sense. You're getting sued by your family members. But three hundred thousand dollars, and that's the link is going to be in the description as well. You're, you're getting sued, but three hundred thousand dollars, and six to eight months later, you realize Michael Jackson sued you. I mean, Michael Jackson touched you. It's, it's just it gets hard after all these allegations. Reading over, it's like it's the same story. Um, this is the last point of contention that I saw, and it's making the rounds via the internet, and and we'll get out of here, man. But it's probably the biggest one. It's definitely the biggest one. And I'm going to start with the clip. And the clip is is when James is talking about how Michael Jackson and him used to get into these sexual acts with each other. And one of them was a location. And that location was the train station at Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. And listen to the clip. At the train station, there's a room upstairs. And we would have sex up there, too. It would happen every day. It sounds sick, but it's kind of like when you're first dating somebody, right? You do a lot of it. So it was very much like that. Now, on his face, that shit sounds terrible. It sounds awful. And that was one of the more believable points to me in the when you're when you're listening to it. It's just, it sounds, it sounds real, so detailed. And that was the thing about this, this documentary, it's very detailed. Uh, but there's a huge problem with this. In James Safechuck's own complaint, he alleges from 1988, from 1988, when the sexual abuse first began through 1992, Michael Jackson engaged in ongoing sexual abuse of plaintiff, which is James Safechuck. So in his own complaint in the court documents, he says from 1998 to 1992, this is when the abuse took place. Well, the Internet being the Internet got the Internet and, and they found receipts. So here's a floor plan that got approved in, the, in September of 1993. I mean, so I'm sorry, the floor plan of that Michael Jackson train station, the particular one where they have all the video and the pictures of, that floor plan didn't get approved until September 1993. And if you look, um, if you look here, there is an AP photo in 1993, and it says, this is an aerial view of Neverland Ranch in 1993 when Jackson was building a train station to resemble the main depot at Disneyland. The ranch is nicknamed for the fairytale land in Michael Jackson's favorite story, Peter Pan, about a boy who couldn't grow up. That was an AP photo, an aerial shot in 1993. The internet found the floor plans of the actual building of the blueprints of this particular train station. And if you look at it, it was approved in September 1993, and these are all the floor pans. And to further corroborate it, I attached a screenshot. There was a segment about Michael Jackson and Neverland Ranch in 1992 that ran that had an aerial shot of, of Neverland Ranch. And if you look, there's some tennis courts. And if you if you go north of the tennis courts, there's a trail, and you go all the way to the left, there's two bushes. And that's where the train station should be in 1992. And if you look at it from 2019 now, that's where it is now. You go north of those tennis courts, you go all of that, those two bushes, that's where the train station is. And if you could, so, and in 1992, that was not built yet. That is huge. And you put that in your film. So this is a huge point of contention. And it made its rounds on the internet, so much so that the director, Dan Reed, even responded to it with a tweet. And he had this to say, 
Yeah, there seems to be no doubt about the station date. The date they have wrong is the end of the abuse. Well, my guy, that, that probably made it a little bit worse because the ongoing litigation clearly states dates and, more importantly, a pattern of Michael Jackson dismissing boys when they became of age. So that's the entire narrative of the film. The entire narrative of the film is he likes boys, and when they reach a certain age, he casts them off. They, they said that about... Uh, Wade with Macaulay Culkin and uh, the other little kids and uh, they also said it here in in James Safechuck's litigation they say uh, he would drill that into the plaintiff over and over again throughout their entire relationship Michael Jackson would tell the plaintiff that it was okay to lie to other people because nothing would happen if you lied at or, about the at or about the time the plaintiff turned 12, a transition period began where Michael Jackson began to focus his attention on a younger boy, Brett Barnes. So here you are implementing a whole nother child into this who, just a side note, Brett, note, Brett Barnes to this day defends Michael Jackson. Here's a tweet of him reading, uh, uh, that I'm reading, that, of him watching the documentary. He says, so people are getting their facts from a movie now? I wonder how they feel about the documentary showing the great alien invasion of 96. I think it was called Independence Day. So that's Brett Barnes tweeting about the Neverland documentary, and you're implementing him in your litigation that directly conflicts with the narrative of the film of the dates and the station of where you were abused. That shit is huge. It's very huge, and I have yet to see a counter-argument for it. Dan, Dan Reed um, is also, he's, he's even backtracked more where he's saying... He's kind of just playing the what aboutism game. He's like, he says, well, look at all the times Michael Jackson has slept in the bed with kids. It's been thousands of nights. That has nothing to do with the claim that has just been debunked in your in your film. So what's happening is James Safechuck is caught in a lie, and the director is is backpedaling trying to trying to make up for it. Essentially, kind of concedes. But then just plays the what aboutism game and says, well, he still does other things. It's a shit show, man. It's a shit show. And when you look at, I mean, we're, we've been here two hours now. If you're still with me, I appreciate it. But I, I, I went into this case for weeks. I, I you know, like I said, there's a lot of le uh, left out. There's a lot more I could add in, and you can. And it, it's just, and it's more. It's it's more inconsistencies. It's more money grabs, and that to me, at the end of the day, that's what it looks like. It feels and looks like a huge money grab, and I, I don't know how another way to spin it, man. But at the end of the day, nobody knows. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Wade Robson knows. James Safechuck knows, and Michael Jackson's dead. So th that's that's it. Um, Jordan Chandler, he's still alive. He knows, but he's 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 remaining silent. So there's very few people that actually know what went on. And I will never know. All I can do is look at the evidence and then assess the situation and come up with my own opinion on it. But what I have found in this entire thing is that kind of what I said at the beginning is I don't have I don't have any business having an opinion about something that I haven't dug into deeply to try to understand the nuances of every single nook and cranny of a situation. And that's what I did here. And what I what I realized is I can stand firm and say that I believe Michael Jackson to be innocent. Of, of these allegations, of these particular allegations. Now, he could, he could, anybody could be a pedophile behind closed doors. It's hard to prove it. I, I, I do concede that, but from the evidence that's given to me, I just don't see it. And I know I, I get a lot of people out there say, oh, you're, you're a pedophile, a neighbor, blah, blah, blah. Kiss my ass. No, I am not. I am not. I think if anybody has any kind of interest in that or, or they have any pattern of doing that, I think they should be locked up. I think they should I think I think it's a sickness. I think it's a disease and I think I think it's it's grotesque. It's one of the worst crimes I feel like we can commit as humans. I'm not I'm not that, but I I did look at this evidence. I looked at case court transcripts and granted there's somebody out there like me who did all the research I did and still thinks that he's guilty. That's fine. That's your opinion. At least I respect it a little bit more cuz you actually looked at it from your view as objective. I can I can live with that, but for for people that haven't looked into it, it's this just it's just not smart to have an opinion on it. You have no idea the nuances and you're just going off of hearsay. And what I found another point is that the media is 
so hungry for blood that this clickbait world that we live in is is it's literally ruining us and i say that it's super melodramatic but it's the truth if you look at the political narrative in our country right now it's all about the clickbait story something will happen and all of a sudden there's hundreds of articles within 20 minutes how could you possibly know what happens in 20 minutes of understanding that a situation has happened journalism is dead and it's and it's because entertainment has been intertwined with news and if you're if you have any kind of intelligence about you you'll wait and assess any situation before you jump and react to it because the world we live in today is a dangerous cesspool of misinformation and i implore you to do all the research you can about a subject before forming an opinion it's a deep, deep dive, and the media is an entirely different topic that we I could even dive into that. But um, one of the things that I think Michael Jackson fans should understand, I think you should stop parroting bad news. One of the things that Michael Jackson fans parrot a lot is Michael Jackson was investigated by the NBI, FBI for 10 years. That's partially true. He wasn't investigated by the FBI for 10 years. He aided in investigations for the Santa Barbara County Police Department for for a, a long period of time and they just ate it. They didn't, it, it, it's, it's a lot different. The FBI was actually opening cases on you. It's, it is, it's not, it's not the same. That's a, that's, it's kind of a false truth that a lot of MJ backers parrot out there. And like I said, really dig into the things that you feel like you know um, because it, 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 should, it should make you feel that much more strong about your convictions if you look at it unbiasedly and come out the same. So I hope y'all enjoyed this, man. I, I did. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the case. But um, I really realized that I, I don't, I, there's a handful of topics that I've actually dug into like this. A handful. And it helped me grow. It helped me grow in it. And I hope, I hope y'all enjoyed it. So let me know in the comments, thoughts, feelings about this, about whatever. If you like this form of podcast, I would love to keep doing these podcasts because I enjoyed it, man. I, I, I love talking to other people, but these deep dives are really fun. I really get to sit and focus on a, on a topic. So let me know if y'all like it and if y'all don't like it. Um, it's, been, it's, been, it's been fun. I appreciate y'all. So we're, we're going to be back next week probably with an interview. But let me know, man. I hope y'all enjoyed it. And Jim Carrey, come fuck with me, bro. To all my, all my regular listeners, you know what it is. We're still trying to get Jim Carrey on. So if you know him, holla at him, man. I appreciate y'all joining in, man, and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next week.